This podcast is brought to you by patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. Head there to check out exclusive podcasts like Talking Futurama, Talk King of the Hill, the What a Cartoon Movie Podcast, and tons more. Cartoons from present in the past. Every week will be an animated bash. What a cartoon! What a cartoon! Short but mostly shows. We'll talk, we'll analyze, exploring as we go. What a cartoon! What a cartoon! What a cartoon! What a cartoon! Hello, everybody, and welcome to What a Cartoon, the Zuzzy Zazziest podcast around. I'm one of your hosts, the man who never says shut up, Bob Mackey, and this is an audio exploration of every cartoon ever who is here with me today as always hey it's henry gilbert and by my calculations this will be a great podcast and this month's episode is all about saturday morning all-star hits whoa what's up kids i'm skip and i'm trevor and we're the new hosts of smash saturday morning all star hits and by the way we're covering the first episode school and as usual it's april so our april fool's prank on you is to cover a a live action cartoon oh this this live action cartoon has a lot of actual cartoons within it yeah yeah it's more like 50 50 but yeah. honestly it's it's a mix of things that we wanted to do this like yes this is our april fools one it mixes in live action but it's such a great recent show less than a year old but me and bob both enjoyed it so much and also as you maybe have seen in the description we are podcast pals with one of the executive producers of the series scott gardner so come on we, yes. we have to cover this show so after our little history here we're going to talk to scott about his involvement in the show it's an hour-long interview so we got a lot of great details about it yeah it was so awesome talking to scott about it but yeah i the moment i learned about this show and then scott was working on it uh saturday morning all-star hits and i i saw that trailer i thought oh this feels like a show made for us exactly and then once I watched the first episode, it I was even better than I dreamed of, really, because it wasn't just a very specific era that they were perfectly parodying, but it was very smart comedy of the style that we love. Yeah, I didn't hear about it until Scott mentioned it on his podcast and when it was premiering, and knowing he was attached, uh, I was like, well, he's the perfect guy, and the other people who are attached, I, I don't know as much about them, but I was like, well, I, I trust Scott Gardner, <laughs> and yes, it's a fantastic show, and you should be watching it. You have Netflix. Yes. I know you do <laughs> they maybe did just up the sub re, subs rate but uh, you you gotta have netflix yeah and it's and it's ever this isn't like when we say oh well sonic's on this thing in north america but sonic is not on this thing in in england or whatever i'm pretty sure it's everywhere on netflix uh, uh, in every place yeah can't say enough good things about it when it first appeared like i just binged it instantly in in december of last year and try to tell everybody to to watch it especially if you're a listener of this podcast who loves when we cover like Disney afternoon cartoons or mm -hmm. or similar like you were alive for this and you know the feeling that this so perfectly captures not just what the cartoons were then there have been many shows that parody this type of era of things but it's not just about you know oh weren't the Care Bears silly or whatever this is about a vibe man yeah you know? and I think that's why it's a it's a tough show for a network to market because a uh, Netflix and other big networks they want the most broad pitch to the audience but this is such a specific show yes. that it needs we need to sit you down and let you know how important and special it is <laughs> and we're gonna describe to you all the things that make it special and why <laughs> it's great it was so fast that it went through like the eight episodes just flew by and it is such a perfectly specific style of comedy full of like great sketches it's a sketch show too but also a series of parodies of things and the more specific it got the more i was like yes keep adding me give me more and more specificity because i remember these things again that's the vibe it captures it's it's like seeing a robocop cartoon and the, right. as, as you grow up you realize like hey wait this shouldn't have been turned into a cartoon for children it was a dark r-rated movie just like casino nights the that gets turned into a cartoon in the show yeah the show is not as broad as like weren't the late 80s early 90s stupid and crazy it just laser focused we'll talk about it with scott but laser focused into like basically 1990 in 1992 and all the fads that were happening then what children's entertainment was like then and just what marketing was like then too i guess too you know if you haven't seen the entire
entire season. This is a comedy show, so it's like spoiler warnings are, you know, it's but I we do talk about things that happened in the last episode of the season. So if you don't want spoilers for that, then you, I definitely say watch the whole season. It flies right by, but it's also a comedy show. So, you know, it's like, well, how yeah. bad or spoilers, but yeah. And yeah, uh, we, we chat about the whole thing with Scott, but uh, a little background though, first, before we get into that, in case you don't know any of the folks who, who worked on the show or how Saturday morning all-star hits came to be on Netflix uh, in late 2021. Uh, so the two creators of the show are Kyle Mooney and Ben Jones. Kyle Mooney is a San Diego native uh, writer, performer, probably most famous for being on Saturday Night Live since 2013. I was like, wow, he is edging up to a decade of being on Saturday Night Live. I will admit to my uh, SNL ignorance because I have not been a follower of the show since the early aughts. And I think I really fell out of following comedy in general around the time we started doing this full time. I don't know why, but it's just like, well, no podcasts are the only medium for me. So <laughs> I'm just learning about a lot of these folks for the first time outside of Scott. And I know Scott through his podcast, obviously. And then from there, I tracked on other things he's done in the past that I had seen. <laughs> well, one of those markers of getting old is when somebody who got hired on SNL in 2013 to you as a comedy nerd feels like a new guy yes. on the show when he's not a new guy. He's He's been there. There, I think more seasons than like Will Ferrell was on it you know like that's that's how long he's been there but yeah Kyle Mooney he's a very specific kind of for performer who he always in other people's sketches he makes jokes about this in his sketches that he is often cast as the nerd and a <laughs> dork then in his sketches it's about him like usually feeling kind of rejected or awkward and then when somebody feels even a slight amount of pity for him he then gets completely full of himself and it's a great dichotomy that really comes comes through in in smash as well uh so mooney like a lot of our favorite american comedy performers of the last 20 years a ucb trained improviser or comedy writer got his start in the aughts uh he was big in the early days of youtube comedy videos like just just like scott gartner our, our pal of just one of those guys who go like whoa dude have you seen this and then you all sit around the computer together and and play videos for and each it's other. a big monitor and there's no youtube on tv yet yes so yeah. it's a crowded space and i and i saw he was born not in the perfect year of 82 but in 1984 an okay year it's close yeah, yeah. it's you know that's the year uh, it's a year before my brother was born if it's if it's between 1980 and 1985 you're good with me after that you're too young i don't uh but if you go back to his now over 10 years old youtube page there's some great videos of like him just awkwardly interviewing major league baseball players or people with reptiles and and yeah he was a big hit in internet comedy of the aughts which i hate that that's so dated now like yeah internet comedy of the aughts like that is a specific era it's not current anymore it's no. actually quite old and also in that time a lot of his stuff was shot with director editor uh, filmmaker dave mccary uh, and mooney and mccary were part of the uh, at ucb the good neighbor sketch comedy group uh, along with nick rutherford and beck bennett and all four of them by 2013 i believe all four got hired to snl mooney as uh, a writer performer beck bennett as as also a writer performer at least in sketches him and Bennett share an office and I think that's in real life too or at least for a time it was like and and him and Beck Bennett have such a funny character dynamic in a lot of their sketches where where Beck is the cool guy and <laughs> Kyle Moody is the not cool guy and and yeah McCary would often film a lot of their digital shorts as well for for SNL and Kyle Mooney he uh, also in 2017 he'd be working on his own side stuff including working with McCary on Brigsby Bear, which is also, you know, a different feel from Smash, but not unlike it because it is also about a strange obsession with 80s children entertainment that twisted in a certain way for a, like a broken person <laughs> except, yeah except in that case it's the winnie the pooh live live action puppety thing that was on disney channel back in the 80s i've heard really good things about it but i have not seen it oh it's great it's great and moody and mccary they've worked on a ton of stuff together and uh you can see where they what they brought to the show because uh you know moody 
Murphy is the uh, lead actor in the series and writer, uh, producer, all that stuff. And McCary, I believe, filmed all of the live action stuff for the show. But who the, directed the animation? Well, that's where it comes in. Ben Jones, a Pittsburgh-born artist uh, who has, even if you don't know his name, has been part of a ton of the weird cable and internet cartoons we've all loved for the past 20 years. Uh, so Ben Jones, he was part of an artist collective called Paper Rad, uh, which worked on several PFFR shows. Uh, he worked as an animator on a lot of those. I couldn't find the specific ones he did for Wonder Shows in, but just watching this show and his other stuff i was like ah man i bet he animated like half the stuff on wonder shows and hmm. that's very weird and off-putting was he working for uh augenblick at the time oh i don't uh sorry Augen that's the animation studio that did a lot of stuff for wonder shows in oh okay i think he was uh from my research it was it seemed like paper rad was like a side group hired to work with that company or okay. work with pffr on it yeah i i don't think he was part of of the the that group though but but yeah he like there's you can feel a lot of wonder shows in dna uh, in this show uh though it's uh certainly a little uh, a little nicer i think than yeah and me again me and bob loved wonder shows in so much uh, wonder shows in was uh, the perfect cruel and bleak show for its time but i feel like having aged 15 years since that show uh first aired i'm like this is a more uh, hopeful version of that yes. uh that's more appropriate for my old age now <laughs> we've we've aged aged into it we're not as as young as we used to be so wonder shows i'm like oh it's too loud this loudness that was funny when i was young is too loud now. these puppets keep screaming <laughs> hey nerds worth <laughs> all right uh but yeah ben jones uh he worked on wonder shows and worked on several other pffr things uh would move on to the cartoon network show problem solvers which he created and also featured several voice acting veterans you would hear on smash following that he got hired uh by fx uh or FXX's answer to Adult Swim ADHD, uh, which I think its biggest show is the Axe Cop show. Uh, right, right. And uh, and he was, uh, Ben Jones was creative director on all the ADHD shows, including uh, his own show he created on there, Stone Quackers, which I've actually not watched before, but I, mean, I think I'm going to pull that one up on Hulu now, actually. But yeah, the ADHD shows, unfortunately, it came at just the wrong time of my extreme workaholism in video game websites. So I didn't make as much time for late night animation blocks as I, I once did uh, and also ben jones has done a ton of voices and stuff that he produces as well as some stuff he didn't including on our beloved show okko OK let's be heroes he's the voice of real magic skeleton oh really okay yeah and jones well he's even directed a cold play music video in 2017 called aliens uh he worked as a creative director on the netflix show neo yokio uh which i think is a good it's a good show i'd, I'd be up for doing that in the future on a podcast as well before smash and now as as scott explained to us in the uh the interview we you'll hear after this but we recorded we've already recorded uh he mentions too that uh, that jones now is creative director uh at bento box the the animation studio for fox and all of the original programming fox is working on seemingly to to deal with a future where perhaps they don't have family guy and simpsons anymore hmm. on the channel. now why could that be <laughs> and then meanwhile scott gardner who's that the super cool cool guy that we all know and love well also got to start early in aughts uh internet comedy uh did you ever share with your friends sex offender shuffle and think who made that awesome thing absolutely well that's scott gardner he he, <laughs> he created that i love sex offender shuffle it's such a funny video. i mean i didn't want to embarrass scott too much by saying i love this old thing you did and this old thing you did yes but uh he was also pivotal in spreading the word about the room tommy why so is the room which is something i found out like really recently yeah and yeah I, th I was the room hipster in my group of friends and that was like 2009 I was like you guys you gotta see the room and when like Tommy Wiseau appeared on Tim and Eric I was like this is a, like an actor they hired to play a fun character I didn't know he was a real guy no no I, I was I was later to the room than most I think it was like 2011 for me yeah I and meanwhile I believe you know I, I think Scott is a little modest about it I, I didn't want to ask him about it either but I have heard that he was like one of the first people in Hollywood telling other people like hey this weird thing is being shown in a movie theater here <laughs> you let's go watch the room guys uh well he discovered tiny fuppets let's let's say that and yes uh, and and also his uh response comics to family circus comics are also hilarious it's just 
him. He shows up in a family circus comic, which has a bad punchline to just say, like, do you not know that that word means? Come on. I, I think that was what I shared the most of Scott's old work without knowing uh, who he was. Yeah, that's well, that's the problem. I, I think this also is a, a sad thing about the past with Internet comedy that it was just like, hey, look at this fun thing. It's cool. They didn't have credits often on these things. So you'd you'd have to do a little extra research to know that Scott Gardner did these things that were so awesome, you know, like, and then he also went over to work at funny or die uh, after that, which uh, I'm sure was a very rewarding <laughs> experience with no difficulties at all. I mean, there are so many podcasters that we listen to that did work at, you know, college humor, funny or die jash, all oh, of these, right, yeah. all of these collectives. And boy, I, I, I mean, uh, we've heard some, you know, behind the scenes stuff on those podcasts about them. And I wish that was a more fruitful era that still continues because it was such a great time for comedy. Comedy, but then it all became like we're making videos for corporations now yeah yeah and also that you don't get paid anything F- that like, too yeah. that too no i mean J- jack allison uh a, a co-worker of his who's also a cool guy that we've had on podcast he's he's been very upfront about how funny or die was not uh didn't make him rich yeah didn't make uh even though they he wrote the great great sketches on it i mean i don't purport to be as funny or talented as like scott gardner or nick weiger but i think it's funny that we also had similar dreams like ah the internet <laughs> just a yes. vast open field that's just springing with hope <laughs> and it just breaks your back over yeah. it instead yeah i that two uh, no, a couple others of his great ones i love i love steamroller safety video the roller coaster safety video with patrick warburton yes. giving the directions everything with clip cup i i love all of it and and then scott he he wrote for conan in the tbs conan era and wrote some some great sketches on there too and then in, in 2015 he even had his own series on comedy center moonbeam city again not not watched enough it's it's bullshit i i missed out on it i didn't see it until like a friend of ours told us like watch moonbeam city this show's great like i was like a year late to it yeah it not and knowing who scott gardner was uh thinking the show wasn't good because of the comedy central marketing which that was the bad part the marketing yeah, was bad terrible marketing now uh but if you have paramount plus it's sitting right there right there for you moonbeam city discover this great show full of again what i love about smash is so there in moonbeam city and i'd love to do that in the future too of just these very specific memories that then get parodied to like oh do you remember going to the bowling alley and only wanting to watch the videos that happen when a strike happens well there's a whole episode about that at moonbeam city uh after that he also did another like video uh a brilliant pilot for adult swim called live in the necropolis the lords of the synth uh, which just rules so hard got millions of views online and then they didn't make it a show like i don't i don't understand i mean hollywood i don't understand this at all it doesn't make sense to me but yeah millions of views like he's scott talked about this in an interview about quibi about him <laughs> trying to pitch shows to quibi and it just like showed to me like why isn't scott scott Gardner makes all these things that like get everybody watches and then he's still like quibi's like i don't know if we want this live in the necropolis thing like oh, just, we'd rather have reese, reese witherspoon narrate things about uh cheetahs for five minutes at a time yeah i mean i'm sure that has nothing to do with that the one of the chief executives so at quibi is the husband of reese witherspoon i doubt that has anything to do no with no uh, I, I whenever i see reese i'm like why isn't she talking about large cats <laughs> yeah, but uh but yeah i mean scott does amazing stuff and then on top of that he does podcast the ride yes. which we love so and and the same friend who was in the Moon Moon City told me to listen to that podcast and I was not a big theme park and I'm like, why would I listen to that? And I started listening to it and because of that podcast... I got into theme parks and I am now an adult theme park freak. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it's sad what happened to us, but I love it. I love being an adult theme park freak too. Mm-hmm, it's now. fun. And, and we have Scott to thank for that. And so, yeah, we, I mean, once we figured out how much we were on the same wavelength as Scott about so many things and then to then see that he's working on a show about like early 90s turn of the decade 80s to 90s kids television is so perfectly done when we couldn't wait to talk about it with scott and, and scott was very giving with his time we went uh, we thought we'd only go 30 minutes we went a whole hour with him and so uh so yeah let's why do we cut to talking with uh, scott about the making of saturday morning all-star hits so joining us for this segment is Scott Gardner. He is an executive producer of Saturday Morning All-Star Hits and also one of the hosts of Podcast The Ride. Welcome to What A Cartoon, Scott. 
Hey guys, what's going on? Thanks for having me, and thanks for uh, for wanting to talk about this this crazy show and this uh, labor of love. It really, it really was. We we cared about this thing uh, very very much. Oh, thanks. No, we we love this show a lot, and we were <laughs> so happy when when I saw the first trailers for it shared like just last December, and I saw your name. I mean, I I love everybody involved in it, but when you retweeted it out and said you were working on, it, I was like, oh my god, this is Scott's new thing too that this is now the perfect show and yeah i i was so excited to to give it a watch it was one of those shows where i had to i wanted to watch every episode in a day but i also didn't want it to be over like <laughs> that really was the the feeling it was not to oh, not geez. to you know talk it up too much but i really did i was like oh, if i watch a third one today then it'll be almost over it, it's not specifically made for cartoon podcasters but we are in the demographic for mm-hmm. sure mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah oh no definitely uh, uh well and thank you for you know, Henry, you've always been such a supporter of, uh, of Moonbeam City as well, and I so thank you for uh, including me in the uh, what's this? W- this is word you'll see in the business that's like uh, auspices, like the names involved in the show are auspices. Uh, uh, and w- once once I saw an internal document where I was the highest ranked person on a show who was not considered an auspice, uh, like wait, why did I not make the the jump? So thank you for considering me a, a, an auspice. I, that's uh, valid. Well, yeah, I we honestly also when doing this, I was like, man, we should really do a podcast about Moonbeam City now too. I feel that that's overdue. I like, and now it, it lives on the uh, Paramount Plus Mountain forever. Dazzle, Rad, Pizzazz, all hang out with Beavis and Butthead and Cartman. I hope they help Duckman up onto the mountain. Yes, they need to let Duckman on. <laughs> He's not there um, yet. Chrysalis might help. Uh, I don't. I, th- I think Dazzle's not thinking about anybody but Dazzle. But uh, yeah, they're off. They're all the. They're off in a cave with uh, a, like uh, a scrapping for food with uh, every other Comedy Central show from 2002 to uh, current day. Like, uh, are there any morsels? Is there anything left? <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I mean, we uh, we love Scott. We had Scott on our podcast multiple times, but this this is the first time we've talked about something with you that you uh, worked on i guess I, our first question is like when how did you get in, involved in saturday morning all-star hits um let's see you know it like <clears throat> came to me i feel like in a magical meant to be sort of way where i was i was aware of it and i was aware of it forming and it occurred to me oh boy i think i know all the I know the auspices on it. You know, these, you know the pe- the people doing it are, are are my friends, and uh, and I feel like there is something I could lend to it beyond uh, you know just hanging out with them, and uh, um, you know that it might be a good use of the hy- hypothetically the animated skill sets that I've I've developed over the years. So um, you know Kyle, I've known for for a long time. We were kind of making YouTube sketch videos around the same time. I feel like we, we kind of came out of the same world uh, of that stuff together. Uh, and then Ben Jones, who I'm, I've, I'd been such an admirer of, I, I had gotten to do a show for Bento Box. I worked on a show called Alien News Desk, which was with Bento Box, uh, uh, the animation studio where uh, Ben is currently the, the creative director and, uh, and Broadway Video was part of that show as well. So they were, everybody, all the parties involved were happy with my work on that thing not to mention just casually in the halls i got to hang out and uh and chat with ben jones and get to know him so i think he it had occurred to him maybe i'd be a good guy to to, to get involved i guess if, if i had to say my specific what hopefully i bring to the table it's you know hopefully i'm somebody who can write a lot and and be an asset on that end but also do the nitty gritty stuff i can be helpful in the voiceover records i can do all of the like homework steps that end up having to happen <laughs> in, the, in the animated process the uh, the animatic where the storyboard marries to the to, to the soundtrack to the radio play which I is a process I'm very passionate about now you know I like doing all the nitty-gritty stuff I like you know getting things to time and figuring out who's gonna play all these parts because all the actors can only play three parts so how do we cover all the ground and uh, uh, you know be efficient that way well that's a long way of saying I you know I, I knew these folks and I think they also beyond my you know wanting to to work in animation and being passionate about that i think they knew that i was a a sponge for the kind of shows that (laughs) we're basing things on and uh you know that my vocabulary with 80s 90s television was was very strong which seemed to be a a requirement for uh, uh, being part of this thing so where did the concept for the show originate and how much did it change over the process of uh, figuring out what it would be 
Let's see. I, so, I, I, yeah, I was not part of, of pitching the show. Um, that was purely Kyle and Ben. And I know that I, I'm, the, the base components of it that I know they had were that idea that it is, uh, it, it's a block of Saturday morning television, but also that that is taped off of TV and that there is the narrative voice of somebody who is deciding what shows they <laughs> like and want to tape and are special to them and things that they ignore and maybe and maybe don't put on or that if they get interested in other stuff they can change the channel or if the stars of the show go appear on this other thing it seemed to be just like a great format and ticket to do a lot of exploring and to not be stuck in a in a type of show that just repeats itself over and over again so th that all was there and i'm trying to think what what they had in their pocket uh, um i mean they they had like a lot of structure by the time i got involved and i think in the pitch they knew they like the big three components of the show like the bigger cartoons in it randy about this uh, depressed uh sometimes suicidal dinosaur adjusting with his, his life changing as he uh uh, as he heads to college that that was there create a crittles which i think was called something else initially like in the pitch but the idea of this artist hiding uh these little friends who were his artistic inspiration and that being at odds with his family uh, um that was in their pitch and then pro bros which was the this uh hyper violent uh show about the less <laughs> prominent brothers of uh, more popular uh, better athletes um i think that all those components were all in the pitch and then there was a lot of stuff in between that that probably uh, uh networks didn't hear about um and i think they <laughs> took it everywhere and netflix uh, liked it the most and, <laughs> uh, and then we started working on it. i forget was there another part of your question i, I missed no that covered everything uh, no, yeah that's yeah i love kyle mooney when he's on uh podcast arrive like he's such i me and my husband when we go to disneyland every single time we have to say my hands don't ski <laughs> we say the line that rocket raccoon says in the guardians ride all the time that kyle mooney constantly was repeating on, on that podcast ride like it was just so so perfect i love it so oh, thank you for giving him the credit for 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 that area because i yeah i went to the park with him and uh, he got me to uh, not be uh, afraid of that ride and actually go on it which is uh, i'm so glad i i have it's <laughs> it's the best but him and uh, this this great writer uh, fran gillespie who we worked with on snl and who worked on on uh, randy within this show uh, a little bit she also i just like <laughs> The whole day, as I recall, was <laughs> my hands <laughs> don't skin. Uh, so, yeah, full credit to them for puffing that up as a, and, a crazy moment in that ride. And that Ben Jones, he sounds like such a cool dude. Like, I had not looked too closely at his career until researching this. And then when I saw, like, the feel of this, too, does remind me of, like, Wonder Shows, in which was one of my favorite shows, like, of the aughts. I, I love that show. And he, and yeah, Jones, like, uh, it, he... Oh, so when did you uh, first meet Jones on the on that Alien News show? Um, yeah, he, you know, I'd met him a little bit at this. He was part of this thing, um, uh, 80 HD when Fox tried to do kind of their own Adult Swim esque block, uh, uh, and he was a big part of that and a big part of the show Stone Quackers, which is one of the more prominent cool shows to come out of that block. I was start I was developing a show there that uh, that, that didn't work out because I got lucky enough to go work at, at Conan, but I was around there a little bit and had met Ben there a tiny bit and was was certainly aware of him. But then you know getting to be around the Bento Box and being in the offices a lot there, I think not long before that show started he had taken over as the the creative director so he has a, a big hand in you know creatively and visually a lot of the stuff that they're doing and especially shows that that haven't come out yet i'd say like like there's there's bento box which did is responsible for bob's burgers and central park all the lauren bouchard shows and then a ton of other stuff for fox especially fox bought the company and there is just a a litany of of uh, primetime Fox shows coming down the, the track that I think you'll really see Ben's hands on. He is a uh, just a, a really remarkable artist and great guy. Throughout the process of this show, there were so many great moments of getting on a Zoom. You're looking at a design or or, or a frame or something where um, it's it's a little off. It could be a little better, and maybe I could stammer for ten minutes and figure and try to sort of get my hands on 
what could be improved about it and he would kind of draw three circles and uh and you go oh my god that's it that's like the amount of uh, uh uh just the distance he could take things with just little changes and it was especially important on something like this where he he really analyzed visually what made these kinds of shows tick and it was important to him that there there be a variety within them and that they all they uh, um it's a tough thing for the same creative group to make a show that is supposed to feel like seven different shows <laughs> like all made by hypothetical different creators which is true if you look at the credits of the each mini show within the show like we we named all of the fake people who uh, created all of these things and we wanted it all to feel you know like all right this one's american and this is like garfield or something but this one was animated in japan but storyboarded in an america uh, and like how do we let, let, let's analyze the approaches that all these shows would have done and uh see if we the same people can make it feel like we're we are uh, you know nine different groups of people <laughs> making that, different shows that fucking rules because i knew that i when i saw at the end of the pro bros that it ended with a logo that looks like the tms logo that was <laughs> like at the end of the littles i was like wow yes this this is the tms show of the show as opposed to the the geek not d Gick ones in the yes, series like yeah. yes yeah. <laughs> thank you for noticing that yeah he he especially was uh excited about uh, uh, attributing deke and the we i just remember as a kid like you'd see these logos come on i never knew what they meant like they're so weird to absorb production company cards and all those things at the end of like you understand disney right i understand like there's a castle at the beginning and the end of the show or warner brothers and it's the shield and maybe bugs bunnies eating a carrot next to the logo the, i get these <laughs> but like what does this mean to me as a child that you'd yeah, get deke or any of these more obscure companies who made these i know it lends the show is a different quality but what is that and and so ben would really particularly analyze well here's the it's important that we know the history of the company and here's how it was founded <laughs> and where they would ship to and uh, then they got sold to this company and that all that did end up being backstory for why things look a certain way or even in some cases where you meet the on screen you meet the actual create the actual fake creator <laughs> of the shows within the show yeah the specificity of the comedy is so great on smash and as someone who was born in the early 80s along with henry it really nails like the uh for me it's like the show feels like it takes place within the 91 92 season everything feels very laser focused Focus to that, including the Bill and Tedification of uh, Saturday Morning TV and just children's entertainment in general. I mean, on Podcast The Ride, you covered it with your um, TGIF shows at Disney episode where it's like every show had a Bill or a Ted or perhaps both. And in fact, uh, Skip and Trebor are very close parodies to something that was a, a real thing on TV. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, what great characters and vehicles for Kyle. It's exactly the kind of thing he, he's obsessed with is, you know, that we're probably yeah when he's a kid like well yeah i mean you guys you know if you're even like slightly older than you maybe remember like yeah we 91 92 is perfect because it's right at the precipice of like we we wanted there to be kind of a grade within the season of maybe the first shows are a little more earnest and a little more sedate but then everything gets a little more like extreme cowabunga radical <laughs> uh, uh particularly with the rise of these hosts skip and trebor the twins who were both played by kyle and they, there's a they were influenced by by a number of things uh, uh cody from step by step who's a character kyle and i both love bill and ted is right on dan cortez was was something that was said a lot there's so much in this type of guy but bob i think what you're referring to is the uh this thing i certainly had never heard of like and boy credit to kyle for being able to pull out a reference i have it's never come across my desk and in this case it's uh this thing chip and peppers cartoon <laughs> madness where for a while it was i guess a block of of, and they're almost impossible to find, but there was some of NBC's cartoon lineup on Saturday mornings, probably in like 91, I, I forget, was hosted by these twins who were inexplicably like, they're like jeans salesmen yeah. or something. Like they're not on screen talent anymore. I, it seemed to be the most random that uh, Brandon Tartikoff, the v kind of visible executive responsible for Saved by the Bell on NBC, I think somehow caught wind of these guys and I'm giving you a show that kind of thing that could not happen <laughs> anymore now like you know, like one guy points 
instances you have a show and but the 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 amateur feel of of them and kind of the rinky dink production value of it was was so addictive and we so we were again these are impossible episodes to find but we're just like okay we found uh three minutes of scraps from chip and pepper what can we extract from this how do we learn how to write a, a chip and pepper segment i it was just a fun like bit of uh, of cultural dumpster diving yeah when i saw the trailer for smash it dredged the memory up out of my head as someone who had seen this and then i look online i can't find any uh, youtube clips or anything and then weeks later i i go on a search to find it but unfortunately all the seo for smash has erased that show from history the chip and pepper show so if you just type in blonde saturday morning cartoon host it's like 20 articles about smash mm-hmm. so uh Whoa. you you guys <laughs> oh, might have so we they had almost nothing and now we dominate well i mean if it makes a if if, if it causes more google results that's, <laughs> that's good news because they th- these things are a lot of fun boy watching them like run around to go into theme park stuff the uh they're running around the fibles playland area that used to be at universal studios and like getting benny hill style chased by a bunch of kids uh, uh through <laughs> like uh uh you know giant uh, uh, buckets uh meant to make you feel like the size of a mouse uh, um just like really addictive silly low rent things I, I but i guess i feel a little bad about that <laughs> I, I don't really <laughs> chip and pepper i don't remember if one of them always getting the short end of the stick was uh, the joke on their show but i i remember one bumper because my brain was very uh plastic at that time absorbing everything and it was a bumper just you know to tell you there's a, there's a commercial coming up one of them is being massaged and he's, he says we'll be back after these massages and the other guy <laughs> who's not getting a massage corrects him and goes messages so <laughs> <laughs> he was not being massaged, but the other one was. So I, I, that's what I dredged up out of my mind. I was like, was one of them always getting the the raw end of the deal here in this original uh, in this original show that uh, you guys are parenting wow. with uh, Skip and Trebor? Yeah, I don't think that was a regular thing, but that's crazy if it resonated with you or like that you remembered that moment or, or thought that could have been a syndrome. I mean, it's possible that Kyle saw that and and thought, well, that's a dynamic to to pull out for this i mean i i love how it was making us laugh so much writing it how at least initially the differences between skip and trebor are all, almost nil like one has their they're your background right now bob and one has straight hair and one has <laughs> wavy hair and i guess that's like and then he he makes up words that sound cool every once in a while and that is enough to make skip a just unstoppable star like straight to movie stardom like you know the the speed of like vanilla ice's rise to, <laughs> to immediately having a movie five months <laughs> after you've heard of him and then trebor is like like destitute almost like how like how could that difference between these two identical guys be so great <laughs> that uh these like shakespearean level stakes unfold between them the I the really arc of it. skip and trebor is so great especially like skip is you're right vanilla ice is so perfect because it was it also is if you experienced it in real time you're hearing about like oh vanilla ice the coolest guy in the world and by the time cool as ice came out or the ninja rap it wasn't cool like everyone's like this guy sucks like once it's finally <laughs> out and i it feels like skip is just about to be tur- in the final episode of the season it feels like skip is just everyone's turning on him right at that moment and he's like oh man like whoa i actually hadn't thought about that aspect of it that maybe he's having it's weird i brought up vanilla ice because we literally never talked about that <laughs> (laughs) while doing it but now i realize yeah that completely is what's happening it's like he lets this kid's popular now let's load him up let's shove him into a movie right now and it's like all unraveling at that exact second i we 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 were also we were excited about that that we're building up this guy and building up this guy to the point where like i don't know would you could you maybe be like annoyed by him he's so like (laughs) confident and getting everything he wants and then in the final episode to kind of give him some pathos and like boy he's like uh he he rose to the top and found out there's not enough there and mm-hmm. that you'd have this huge like get ready for the skip of the strong of premiere and then it like and then cut to the most sedate like you you have never seen this guy sad before and it's all playing out live uh, it was just fun to uh, come up with all that i love too in that that the the actual movie stars who are having to be interviewed by him they're giving him nothing and they're like <laughs> no like nothing like they don't give a shit about him they like, won't do bits <laughs> yeah i that might have been that's among my favorite things to to one of my favorite things to to, to write i i feel like I think Kyle and I kind of did that stuff together and it was making us laugh so hard that these guys would yeah yeah skip is not in the club he is not there there's 
the stars of the real movie, Intimate Compromise, Casino Night Seductions, <laughs> which is like well, what we regarded like when we we're kids. We're like, this is what adult movies are. They are serious. There are no fun. There is no catchphrase. <laughs> They're about murder and sex and weapons. <laughs> and those guys giving him the cold shoulder. Oh, my God. Like it, it felt genuinely tense on, on set from that, that actor. <laughs> he played that so well. Like I have no time of day for this goofy man one well, scott uh how did you guys do all the like there's some really complicated live action stuff with you think of skip and trevor as two separate beings not the same actor in the same space like uh, how, how would you guys pull that off yeah god i um full credit to dave mccary who's kyle's uh you know longtime good friend and, and director and made his movie uh brigsby bear with him and all the snl sketches and good neighbor sketches anybody knows he he worked out this whole the, we, the whole time we were writing we thought well it's that chip and pepper style right so these things will be like really easy to shoot and maybe even kind of crappy looking and uh because these are just done you know the way you you know they just send a camera guy and a boom guy out to a park and film these guys running around and that'll be easy and then the uh the, the production team who like did phenomenally uh with this this company colossal youth they were the first to say yeah but it's the same guy so it sounds <laughs> easy but that yeah the style is weird and low rent but you got to do it twice and build in the, the costume changes and and all that and so then not to mention it's a style where you don't want to do parent trap where it's locked off and there's a clear tree in the middle that is the point where the frame is being split so you know how they're doing the twin effect like audiences are too advanced to watch something that lame he we, dave the director didn't even want it to be uh, locked off or on a tripod uh like let's let's see if we oh. can do the handheld and the shakiness and so the solution to that was a motion controlled camera you know which is how they would do uh, an eddie murphy movie or something something where <laughs> right. um you know we the camera uh, organically does what it, it it wants to do and we we do it back and forth in handhelds and little zooms and that kind of thing we work out a whole complicated motion that might be as long as like a, a full unbroken minute do that with kyle as skip they pick a take that they like i think we really nailed it on three okay let's lock that in kyle go change we'll film a plate with nobody in there there was also a, a double on hand at all times for kyle to play off of so then he'd go switch they would go switch wardrobe probably not the same uh, shirts literally but uh, <laughs> uh not each other's uh, uh sweat but anyway they then kyle would have to return and uh, go do the trebor side of it and and they could also have instant playback on all this so on set you were you they could like roughly divide half of the frame and uh so you could like watch Kyle doing it live with himself and he had a little earpiece in to where he could he was just playing off of something he himself did 15 minutes prior it was wild and then wow. the shoot days were just switching back and forth constantly like you'd get to a location all right let's do the Trebor side now we'll keep him in Trebor and we'll do that part first and then like this log logistically was uh, amazing to watch happen and big credit to Dave for uh, sorting out the the admittedly complicated math of it and Kyle what a <laughs> what an actor oh my yes. god to this like is... do two pretty different characters despite being similar looking and fit like there's the difference between them is subtle but really clear yeah it was such a like a, a actor boot camp for him and i was i was so impressed watching it absolutely this is where i admit so i was watching this show on a 27 inch tv in my bedroom at the far end of the room until i started doing research on the show after watching it all i didn't know kyle was playing both characters that's how well done this was i was like oh they must be they must be standing a little further apart from each other because of covid i guess but that is how well Whoa. done it was i don't think i'm that uh that credulous but i assume like well yeah one of these guys is kyle mooney i don't know his work that well but who's this other guy they, they really play off each other very well wow. so it fooled me and i'm wondering if it fooled anyone else jeez you're making our dreams come true <laughs> with that that's fantastic i mean yeah the only three like because we also wanted the general feeling of this that if you just stumbled on it and you didn't recognize anybody in it if you don't know kyle or you don't know uh dylan sprouse who appears in it wonderfully it was great to have him but besides that that you could plausibly think is this 
is just a bunch of old tapes. Like, it's, <laughs> hopefully, uh, animation wise, it's authentic enough, and shooting wise, it's authentic enough. That yeah, that that, that makes me feel good in I, terms of uh, authenticity and like hiding the the trick a little bit. No, I want to compliment Kyle's acting in those things because he is he's playing these huge ridiculous guys who are just so like big, like whoa. God. But when he has to play like just like a person who gets is just offended in a moment or just like hurt, but then they can't. <laughs> let they don't want people to know that their feelings are hurt. They're like yeah all right let's go like just he he can play those subtle Still has emotions right? to have his game face yeah yeah, I, yeah maybe nobody's better at the like the slow burn like oh okay well like somebody who just got punched in the gut but can't show it and that was important to us too that we not do a lot of straight man that trebor gets devastated by something but he's still on the show and they have to have plausibly included this in the cut and aired it on TV. Like in a sketch, you might have him, you know, call out what just happened or get into a fight with Skip, <laughs> but the show would edit that out, right? They wouldn't put that on. So it was up to Kyle to do like just enough where they could get a usable take of everything, <laughs> but that uh, um, that still plays by the rules of what they could, what they could air. So it was a, a thin line that I think he played very well. Well, acting wise and writing wise, what a what a writer! He's a, he's an awesome writer, Tim. I love the reactor on Tra the reaction on Trebor's face when he like when he has to explain the part that Johnny Rash has in the movie, which is the part he should have because it's his twin brother, but he wasn't <laughs> yes. he wasn't cast in it, and he has to like promote this thing he should be in is just god his acting or the reaction on Trebor's face when he's waiting for like Skip, who's directing his voice acting, and just he goes like. And he just like mutes it and sees everybody reacting to like his performance. And he's like, uh, uh, we're good. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. It's like, uh, oh, that, yeah. That, the, that on the, it, it's how I've uh, uh, felt even in like VO sessions that were, that were technically successful. Like it's still, it's an oddly intimate uh, um, pressure filled situation where to be like stuck in this box and you can't hear what the other people are saying and you're like lonely in there. So you're looking in like, uh oh, and you might take any gesture as being like, no, it's bad. I didn't like it. So him, that was me writing my worst nightmares. Like, <laughs> yeah, Trebor watching a bunch of people all clearly gesticulating. He's bad. This is bad. Fire him. But he can't hear it and he can't leave and he's stuck and true, true purgatory. It's an awful situation for him. Uh, you know, actually, as an older brother to a younger brother, I, I don't like this show's direct attack on us being jealous of our more successful, <laughs> prominent brothers. I don't like this. Like, <laughs> but... But, but yeah, that's that's really the theme. My uh, yeah, brother jealousy. I'm not even sure where that lands in terms of anyone's real dynamic. Uh, uh, and we also couldn't decide: is it better for it to be? Should it just be generic brother because Skip and Trebor are twins, or is there something more like that your younger brother does better than you? I guess there's a lot of ways that that icky brother feelings can land. On Pro Bros, I love how everything like Ethan comes out more and more in the story of what he. Like, like how he is constantly <laughs> talking about like actually I'm good at cooking too if only my family support like just that he's <laughs> and just saying that like this guy he, he learns that spotlight is to be shared like how he is dealing <laughs> with his uh, mental issues with his brother's success in the worst way possible it's so so good <laughs> All really fun to write from the the ham-fisted perspective of a guy who is trying to prove himself the hero in in his real situation and yeah the the creators the fake creators voice really leaking into the project and informing it i i um, is just something like i mean it's something i've enjoyed doing on like a smaller scale and on things i i haven't been uh, paid for so it was crazy to like <laughs> oh that's what you want on this show is like you're not only watching the show but you have to be aware of the psychology of the guy writing it who's just like blatantly inserting himself into it just so fun i love the parodies of mini fads like uh, you know the bill and ted style characters one thing i really like that's only one segment is the parody of the uh stand-up driven cartoons in which uh like bobby's world the live action uh person the cartoon is based on will often just be in the show doing intros in this case he keeps interrupting but i just love a, a look at that era and it looks like it's kind of still happening because there is an ellen degeneres cartoon 
cartoon. Oh, right. There's Little yeah. Ellen. I mean, yeah. there was like a little Bill Cosby show. Like the 90s were just full of these because I think stand up comedy or maybe just sitcoms were so big. They were trying to spread the talent around from these big stand ups. Yeah, I guess. Well, and, and you know, there, there was Life with Louis, the Louis Anderson one, too, which, you know, m- must have come out of Bobby's world. I don't know who was who was first to. Oh, it was Bobby's world it. first and then Louis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I don't, yeah. So maybe that like created a market for, for more of them. But yeah, that that John realizing when that was formed like there was the the desire to do something with bruce channeling this terrible stand-up who kyle plays it's kind of his signature character and (laughs) that that was already fun like oh him getting a cartoon oh and you know what it could be is one of those the like here's a window into my mind kind of show Uh, full credit to kyle for that because he knows bruce so well and has been doing bruce forever and knows uh you know knows exactly how to create this like nightmarish bed of terrible comedy but then uh the meltdown that occurs like (laughs) it was it was really fun to watch that come together and how it's the uh the structure of what he'll go do you know for two minutes on weekend update but then here you get to literally go inside his brain (laughs) Uh, um and and maybe the Maybe the only thing I could take credit for, little Bruce Wise, was the idea that it's a show that's all about the wild imagination. He's a stand-up comedian. If you could see what a stand-up thinks of and dreams of <laughs> using the medium of animation, all the, oh, the places you could go. But then that that the only thing he can think of is that everything's like the Wild West. That, <laughs> the yeah. School's like a, a jail cell <laughs> and in the Wild West, and the school bus is a jail cell. Like he's. He does not have enough imagination to do the wild imagination show. That was my favorite angle of the little Brucey segment because so many of those cartoons did not have enough material to tell a story. So the car- the characters would often like go into their imaginations and have like little segments and adventures. <laughs> uh, I love that. Yeah. Their, their own stories so that if the main story isn't compelling enough, well, let's just like send them to space. I mean, like it's probably I, I, I regard and recall Muppet Babies as being like one of the stronger cartoons any of us grew up with and probably would still hold up but that's like if you're watching a bad episode of muppet babies maybe that's what <laughs> oh what's, i mean we recently we recently covered that on our uh, podcast a lot of muppet babies is watching them walk from room to room yes, there's a, yeah there's a lot of uh, padding in those episodes <laughs> but but i do think it did come from a better place than it was meant to be hey y'all this he-man show in transformers are, are violent things trying to sell you toys we're gonna to sell kids imagination and trying to be creative but also toys i mean there were so many muppet baby toys in our childhood but <laughs> that uh yeah. was a byproduct of it <laughs> sure sure but yeah but not the but of course it's gonna happen because yeah. they're little and cute and fun but you know another of my favorites was strong moles because i as a kid would love the ninja turtles when they first started and as i grew older and wanted them to be more violent they got less violent and michelangelo like just took over the show and he didn't even have nunchucks anymore <laughs> More. And so the, the Strongable start is this cool action show and then Skip just destroys it and it's the Skip show. Like is that is another of the like great storylines of the whole season. I, I love that. Oh thanks. Yeah, that was really fun to to map out and, and to break down like it was interesting starting the show because things were like a little not locked in, I don't want to say, but like they they were they, they even before I started, they'd started to figure out like the percentages of animation to live action and like episode breakdowns of like well we know that we want like uh randy is going to be in these episodes and crittles is going to be in these episodes and then we and then um strongables is going to be shorter uh and they'll be spread through these and there needs to be kind of this like general uh, arc that happens with the so it was really fun to figure out how to break that down like okay we got four slots so how do we do a gradient from starting with it is a fully committed the things you named check henry like he-man trans Transformers. It's the kind of show with a lot of mythology and that maybe is aiming for more of like a uh, kind of a serious Dungeons and Dragons, like where you could like, you know, really get involved, maybe read a comic that it's based on and like care about the world and the planet. <laughs> and then by the end, it is a hackneyed Saved by the Bell. It's a sitcom about dates and the Strongables <laughs> barely appear in it. 
but they still want to do the toy thing. So like, all right, we need to have them around just enough to still promote weapons and vans and products and stuff. <laughs> so figuring out how to get from one to the other, that was one of the most satisfying steps of this process to be involved with. And, and watching the, the in-between where like this one is a little bit more skip and he's kind of, you can see the <laughs> like the writers are starting to run this way and uh, and now the Strongholds are around, but they, they like their task ends, like the point of the series is over. And they're like, what do we do now? I don't know, go ride roller coasters because <laughs> that's another i i to speak to the theme park thing too i always love like tgif where let's just kill a bunch of time in this episode by having characters go on rides and there's no story doesn't matter it's gonna be fun to watch them go on the rides <laughs> so watch it like building in a pointless block of stuff like that for the strong animals to do uh we were excited about and part of the parodies uh involve getting actual voice talent from the time like uh Chris summer and frank welkler uh, i believe uh maurice maurice lamarche is also a voice actor on the shows too yes yeah maurice lamarche that was an exciting one you know what was fun was explaining to him uh because he was the character grisdom who is the uh you know, kind of the splinter uh, equivalent to the the strong moles, a wise uh, grizzly bear who sends them on their missions, and uh, he kind of represents the the old show in, in strong moles, and then it. We, so we had to explain to him well, what's happening is that you're being like written out of the show and maybe you as the actor could feel a little like put off by this like I don't like uh, uh, you know we're changing creative directions but you have to do it yourself and he hearing him say like I think I've been a part of a few of these before <laughs> like, he, he completely had uh, uh, like witnessed that syndrome on things he was a part of which was, was very fun yeah that element of it was crazy and, and we uh, getting to work with this kind of talent and, and um, Maurice LaMarche being one of the coolest ones. Oh, my God. And just, like, the ability these guys have to just, you throw a, a couple references at them. It's, uh, you know, it's Jimmy Stewart with a little less of the uncertainty and the hemming and hawing. And he, like comes up with something right away there's there's such they're like the they're the equivalence of like the great like wrecking crew 60s 70s studio musicians where they have to go in knowing almost nothing invent something from whole cloth nail it and then do it again like seven times that day but yeah, it was kind of our idea that well what if this was less comedian oriented in the voices and more um the, those real voice actors who were still around because maybe that would lend some authenticity and the sincerity that we want and the the feeling that it's not you know we're not parodying these shows we're not attacking them it's not like these things were so bad or so cheesy we wanted all of these shows to feel like authentic and, and cool and like they could have been shows back then if you know granted they're a little more like they're a little darker than what would have actually aired but you know those those actors doing it sincerely and, and committing to it that you know gave us a lot of the air that we want I um, oh i also wanted to call out uh, pamela adlon i love hearing her at any show but we're covering king of the hill right now on our network and uh she's just amazing in everything she does she was so cool we had to record these things over zoom so we didn't get to meet a lot of these people in person but that was just like i like her uh, joy and enthusiasm and she's just she is hilarious she like she brought so much to it i, I even forgot that one was a zoom it felt like we were like at a party with her <laughs> uh, um she is just like so fun to to mess around with and bust your balls and is just just funny as hell um and i i nerded out on that one because she does the voice of kind of a little wienery kid in the our equivalent of cartoon all-stars to the rescue this anti-drug special she's like a little do-gooder little boy and when we were trying to figure out the design of that kid there was we like we weren't quite nailing it and uh and then somebody said what did you look like as a as a nine-year-old scott <laughs> and i went and got a picture and put it up to the camera and they were like that's it and ben just started drawing me at it immediately like i was the perfect uh you know to use the language on our show a, a good boy i was a good boy <laughs> <laughs> what mom says i don't do things that are wrong and anyway she had pamela adlon did that voice and it's its own thing it's not fully bobby hill but you of course hear the bobby hill in it so hearing a bobby hill-esque voice coming out of who is supposed to look like me at nine boy this is an animation dream come true this is so much in, in a blender 
uh, uh, to geek out on. I, I love her and Randy. She plays the stereotypical nerd of the group of, of kids the, that has the fat, the, you play the fat kid in that one, the, but who, who is, does not appreciate the fat jokes and, and shuts it down. <laughs> you know, in a very you know what's way. funny? I think that was me in the, the, I think I tempted it, but then it ended up being Beck Bennett. I, oh, I believe. Okay. It was me for like a lot of the show. Like th- that was a fun thing about this that I, you know, it was all done through the pandemic and anybody listening to this, who's heard podcasts, the ride, I spent the whole thing on zoom on this computer I'm on right now <laughs> talking for two hours about rides and stuff, but then maybe I'd stop and go like, all right, now I got to go do all the temp for Randy and for pro pros and everything. <laughs> Some of which stayed in the show and ended up in the show, but it was really fun to be like, Wow, this is a big real show that's going to end up on Netflix, but I'm doing it the same DIY way I'm doing the <laughs> podcast. Uh, like it was, there was a, a fun symmetry there and like a directness to like, there's not a bunch of steps and a bunch of executives to go through. It's just hit record and do something. Also, like Cree Summer was another one. Like when I heard her voice, I was like, oh, this is perfect. Cause she's been doing this since we were like, when we were born, basically, she was in Inspector Gadget as, as Penny. Like she's been doing this for so long. And, like she i think she's just so great like she even does like basically a penny in the last episode yes. for the casino oh, nights yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, realizing that could be the casting. Oh, she's essentially doing Penny. Yeah, she's amazing. She was on my show, Moonbeam City, a bunch too. And you like, you get in a pinch with these things where you write varied characters and then realize budgetarily, these should probably, a bunch of these need to be the same (laughs) person. So it's really why these people come in handy is like to not only like, okay, can you be these three types who are all totally different from each other, but also do them like, make them like full effervescent characters despite you were maybe only reading this for the first time right now the ability of these people and she's god she's cool as hell you don't want records with her to end she's so cool and tells cool stories and just has a great energy i guess my last one about the the vets on this was like yeah friend as i was watching it i kept waiting was like man i hope frank welker's in this and then boom there he is in in pro bros like yeah he must have like a million stories the frank welker yeah, I'm trying to think, you know, uh, um, his was that we were like so thrilled with with him. And, uh, but, you know, yeah, I mean, we got to work with all these people who were who were big presences in the 80s and 90s and cartoons we grew up with. But he goes back to I mean, he's been Fred on Scooby-Doo since the late 60s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you st- there's ones you forget about. We were I think we were like it was the night before we were going to record with him. and We were getting some things in order. And then somebody brought up, well, you know, he's the did you know he's the Mars attacks aliens and like what you are kidding he is like ah, ah, ah. the most <laughs> iconic crazy choices I've ever heard in, in anything and then like so I'm geeking out about that and Ben is still but Mars attacks less his thing he thinks that's cool but he hasn't fully reached dork status and then somebody pointed out that he is Totoro and then Ben lost his shit <laughs> suddenly we were all like trembling at the knees nervous to even be on the phone with him just remembering all of those right before recording but he was cool as hell there was less time with him that was kind of a like done over i don't think we even had a video feed on him we just uh got the job done but one one very cool thing I and mean, we knew him him being a like scary deep voice villain was going to be the coolest thing uh, as as ronnie selfish i you know dream casting for that but we were realizing like we don't want to waste this we don't want to only do that is there anything else we can throw at him uh what else do we have and then realizing oh my god there's the character puppy the dog who is our mickey mouse equivalent supposed to be the classic character been around since the 30s and we had really no idea what to do there and and we thought, oh my God, we have the like the best animal guy <laughs> ever in voiceover coming in, and he can just we can have him do a bunch of dog sounds that will not be generic. They'll be like really specific and a choice, and feel like a really popular cartoon character. So yeah, get, getting that range out of him was just and hearing that voice, like hearing like Megatron's voice essentially coming out of the phone. I I just you you, you hear my my dorkiness on this. Yes, I <laughs> really lit up by it. I okay, puppy the. Dog dog in the world of the show is another my in my second watch that was one of my favorite like little breadcrumb things because like there's a rating shot and you see that it's the lowest rated no kid in 91 like gives a crap about puppy the dog but he still has like 
all this prestige. So then when he shows up in the Don't Say Shut Up special, the kid asks him, like, wow, Puppy the Dog. Oh. <laughs> like, that's, I, I love the story with Puppy the Dog. That's just great. Just oh, one thanks, little thanks. thing. And, and same he, with... Yeah, he's, he's a... Le- it's like us with Mickey Mouse as a kid where we, we haven't even seen the Mickey stuff. So why do we care about yeah. Mickey? I don't know, because you're told to. So that's the equivalent of, like, a, presumably there was a funny Puppy the Dog short in, like, 1938, but uh, <laughs> not, we wouldn't know it. Oh, yeah, I want to go back to that because Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue was, like, a kitsch favorite of mine for, like, 30 years. And, like, everyone mm-hmm. online has been talking about this for a while, but I've never actually seen a parody on a television show until uh, All-Star cartoons say, don't say shut up, <laughs> which is uh, pitch perfect. Perfect, and I can't believe how faithful it is to that piece of uh, uh, war on drugs propaganda that was aired on like three networks simultaneously, released on video for, as a free rental, and now lives on as people mocking it uh, on the internet. But now it's on a TV show. Oh man, I yeah, thanks. I, I that that was a little treasure waiting for me when I like read the outline, like vaguely what the episodes were supposed to be, and like I remember turning the page and getting to that, and like, oh you motherfucker, this is so great. Yes, <laughs> and then we're gonna do it with it's the, the the feeling that that thing's supposed to have of it's oh my god Garfield and the Ninja Turtles and Alvin and the Chipmunks are all meeting but trying to summon that feeling for characters you only just met two episodes ago or in some cases have never met we wanted there to be characters who pop up they're like what's that so we have these <laughs> uh, Smurf equivalents called the Meeps yeah I, I you know analyzing that thing and trying to figure out what makes it tick and and that it's you know it's it's scary and heavy handed and moralistic but also like fun. I think there's a reason that Cartoon All Stars has has maintained, and we're all obsessed with it. Which is like it is cool to see all these mismatchy characters go on an adventure together and fight pure evil. You have the weird like Catholic guilt running through it, but then it <laughs> is there is a novelty to seeing everybody. And that was a cool one with Frank Welker. Was we were describing to him. It's kind of a parody of that thing. And then Kyle realizing, wait, you're in that. You, you're, yeah. you must be in that, right? I forget as who. He's Baby he's Kermit, Slimer. I believe, right? And Slimer. And Slimer. And Slimer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah. Slimer, which we were kind of doing the slime of Slimerification of a sh- where the Ghostbusters got fully taken over by that cartoon Slimer. That was sort of what we're doing with Skip and the Strongmoles. And then when we realized, do oh, we have the actual voice of Slimer <laughs> in this? Like the guy, res- the the character responsible for that takeover. That pissed me off so much as a kid when Slimer took that <laughs> over. That was it was because my little brother it, he loved Slimer, and I was like, no, Peter Venkman's the star. What are you talking about? Like, yeah, yeah it turned to half Ghostbusters half Tom and Jerry shorts yes, yeah. basically <laughs> and yeah I guess Maurice LaMarche got less to do because he's Egon in yeah, that show that's right uh, I guess too, that must have been been one of the ones he's talking about he also was part of Pinky Elmira in the brain oh well, uh, yes like weird rearranged latter day version of, of that which I don't know why that calculation was made to uh, help the show I don't know it seems but, arbitrary but yeah the layout of don't say shut up is is so perfect like it hits the like here's where Michelangelo but skin is like moralizing <laughs> to you and saying no that's not cool man like this i think my favorite line is when the girl says when she sees piles of dead bodies she says kids don't know how to build coffins or tombstones <laughs> and bury these children <laughs> yes yeah, so that's what would happen in a world where people say shut up too much obviously that would lead to <laughs> children being so confident they can they don't need to know how to build tombstones <laughs> uh, um what was my there was something else about oh there's there's a really specific thing, uh, which is the fact that all the characters go out of the, they all appear via objects in the bedroom and then all go out the window and ha- go on the adventure. But Lil Bruce stays behind because he's a doormat. He doesn't get to go. <laughs> he doesn't have the abilities they have to run out the window, which is based on in the real thing, Winnie the Pooh just waves and doesn't get <laughs> right, to go on right, the right. adventure, which is my wife and I's favorite detail forever. So I'm like, well, something has to match that too, that somebody, <laughs> one of the characters doesn't get to go arbitrarily. Disney clearly had more rules for him, it's, it seems like. <laughs> it's, oh, uh, maybe. Didn't want him anywhere near drugs. Yeah, <laughs> like Winnie, uh, the, Winnie the Pooh can't uh, can't even like throw out a crack pipe. He, uh, <laughs> he, he can't look at one. I think that's, that's off brand. The running joke of shut up being a catchphrase, like a rude catchphrase is great because uh, through our podcast Talking Simpsons, uh, when we have 
lots of guests on, we always ask, you know, did you watch the show as a kid? A lot of our guests couldn't watch the show because parents were most afraid of them imitating Bart and being a little smart ass. They thought that kids would not naturally find that ability. They would have to see it on TV first. So that was a huge fear of parents like, oh, kids will learn to sass back because Bart is bad. Right. Yeah, yeah. I guess it is kind of the, the, the equivalent of that. And yes, that how, how mild it seems. But yeah, isn't it plausibly a, a thing that in 1992 could have been the most uh, satanic panic? Uh, I mean, my mom did not like when she saw things that I, I remember watching some puppet show as a kid and, a, and characters yelled shut up to each other like for like two minutes straight. And she thought that's too me. Like you shouldn't be saying shut up all the time. <laughs> I uh, But and I mean, also just the brilliance of don't say shut up, meaning shut up, saying shut up like that. <laughs> is such yeah a great and then title. The, the song is the most complicated the song is sung by nuance this pop star we've never heard of before that I, only you can just say don't say shut up yes. if i if you can if i, if I can get into like convolutedness in, in dialogue uh, we don't want to keep you forever but yeah i guess you know what what did do you guys have have hopes for a season two do you dream of a season two like what what's the what's the future of smash um certainly dream of it and and, and we'd, we'd love to get to do it and it's it's a format where you know you could like time travel a lot i think that's where you know we could keep elements that that were hopefully successful in season one but kind of branch out and go other uh uh, directions uh uh, and you know i i think we're sort of hinting at you know later 90s stuff you know and 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 getting into like mtv and grunge world like but also you could go you know you could watch stuff from the 70s and 80s too like the 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 vhs has time machine and you know and getting to like solve some of these mysteries would be really neat i i I don't know i i uh you know it is unfortunately it did land immediately on that like culty like i feel like by day two i was seeing tweets that were like why is nobody talking about this show and i'm like (laughs) i don't know how did we get there all really um i which i think you know the tough thing with netflix is like success in their eyes is squid game like something that everyone in the world is talking about so the the benefit of netflix is they didn't note this thing at all Hmm. but it's also it's also a little like sink or swim in terms of like well we're gonna put it out there's not a lot we can do for it but like hopefully people dig it and see it and which makes me so happy you guys dug it and saw it and i hope your listeners do the same because um it's you know it's it's a little engine that could we didn't have a ton of money to to do it it wasn't the biggest staff in the world but we all did it with a lot of like care and and love and and affection so i i hope that shows in the the final product oh i totally i think it i mean absolutely to now talk through you with these specifics i was like okay i wasn't just imagining things here this is that one i mean yeah to know that like just to see these ideas of like oh this is when the johnny rash commercial for subs comes up like at the worst time ever when he is being arrested it's like that's how it was then like you would just hear like oh this at like millie vanilli is on the mario brothers cartoon the same week they're giving back their grammy or whatever you know like that that kind of feeling growing up yeah or that one i just learned about about oj being on uh uh, adventures in wonderland um that's a really bizarre one. right yeah um yes. yeah that one can't, that's a perfect example that 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 video that we're like i did the voiceover for it and i just made it and edited it myself because the episode kind of ended and we realized like oh we don't really have an ending for this huh <laughs> well it'd probably be funny if we ended on this sad note but then a really d- cheerful commercial came in <laughs> so like anything again as i was saying about the podcast like i got to do this in such a a lot we all did it in like a hands-on way where we're all like making it like we used to make internet videos like what what kyle came from and what ben came from and uh so getting to do that and have it be on a platform like netflix is very special it all it feels like very direct from us and just what we wanted to do and those things don't come up uh, a lot they're tough to get off the ground so it's uh, that's what it'll it'll make it always very special for us we got to do this yeah the freedom you're given seems amazing Mm -hmm. on this project for sure it's crazy i yeah it feels very uh to to nod to griffin newman it feels very blank check (laughs) we got a blank check uh and those yeah you don't get those i and it's where you got to thank uh kyle and ben for you know like you know using their cachet to get this uh this crazy fever dream made i'm so impressed that they got it off the ground and, and thankful they they had me around for 
for it. Thank you so much, Scott, for for your time and to ch- chat about this. We could talk forever of just telling you what our favorite jokes were and, and hearing about. It, but oh, what, it's so appreciated. I mean, like this is the response you want. What you know, like it's it's not particularly exciting to just hear like, wow, they made they parodied the '80s and '90s. Hearing like the level of what you guys got and and like the level of reference point and detail you you grasped and understood. And a lot of people have said they feel like this show was made just for them. And I, uh, I, I, I love hearing that. That's cool to hear. So Scott, thanks so much for joining us on What a Cartoon. Please let people know where they can find you online and more about uh, Podcast The Ride. We've been on it. We love it. You guys have been on our show a bunch. Yes, indeed. Yeah, always happy to talk to you guys uh, and th- this this one included. And thanks for putting the spotlight on this show. Yes, uh, uh, you guys were great on Podcast The Ride. We talked about the Simpsons ride. We Hey, we talk about, uh, it's a theme park podcast. We talk about different rides every week, but also weird other uh, themed insanity. We just did a big month about uh, celebrity owned restaurants like Steven Spielberg's Dive and Planet Hollywood. Um, I feel like almost every one of those is something the Simpsons made fun of uh, <laughs> at some point. Uh, um, maybe not Chris Angel's Kablip. That's a new one. Uh, Simpsons doesn't hit that one yet. But uh, I was very proud of that month and of the podcast in, in general. And we got a lot of fun stuff coming up there. I am at Scott Gardner. My name, if you were remember how to spell it on uh on twitter and yeah i mean if this you know if you're listening to this and uh haven't already checked out saturday morning all-star hits uh uh, give it a go we're uh super proud of it and uh boy do i love that unlike me and a lot of my friends have all put a lot of work and and done things we're really excited about for like you know uh uh, quibbies and cso's and (laughs) few boos and those kinds of places (laughs) and uh where they end up kind of hard to find and i love that this is a um it's, I feel very lucky that it's a thing that we we care a lot about that's on Netflix.com. That's an easy one. People have it and it's there. <laughs> yeah, it's a, not not going away anytime soon, which feels good. So uh, you know, yeah, check check out the show there. You know, I, I love the clip cup of verse as well when you mentioned VB there. That is also <laughs> amazing. But I Well, yeah, that's at least, you know, uh, uh, Viewboo, which is a streamer that I've done a lot of uh, uh, work for and may in fact be the uh, sole owner and creator of uh, <laughs> V-I-O-O-B-U.com. Uh, um, yeah, that one's pretty easy to find. It's all free, n- no login. But that is an entire, as you know, like that's this whole universe that I've gotten to create where it's a show written by a guy and there's the fake creator of the thing. And like, again, again getting to work those muscles on 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 this thing uh, um, on, on a big scale was um, super cool. It's- I- I, I guess I can't. I need. I need to. Th- I need my fake writers. That's it, my. Uh, that's my writer crutch. I need it to pr- pretend it's somebody else. They, well, and as we all learn from Pro Bros, the spotlight is made to be shared. So we, <laughs> we love to share the spotlight with you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thanks again so much to Scott. Now, let's take a break. And when we come back, me and Bob are going to go through tape one, school of Saturday morning all-star hits. Saturday morning all-star hits will return after these messages. The Maggie Mitten. The power's not just in your hands, it is your hands. The Mega Man, for the next Tronico gaming entertainment system. Now you are one with the games. Whoa, guys, welcome to the break. It's Henry Gilbert, and this is the Smash episode. Hey, everybody, it's the much more sober Bob Mackey, and I guess I'm the Traybor of this ad break. <laughs> uh, you know, hey, uh, we, each, each of us trades off being Skip and Traybor. Kind of, <laughs> uh, but welcome to the break. This was a great, great episode of What a Cartoon. I, I hate to brag about ourselves, but it was so awesome to have on Scott Gardner uh, to talk about this show. He and, rules. Uh, he was so nice and giving with his time. Follow him on Twitter and, and listen to podcasts around. And, and watch all his shows. He's great. And, and, you know, me and Bob couldn't talk with Scott for over an hour about Saturday Morning All-Star Hits if we didn't have awesome supporters at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. 
That's right. Our show is completely supported by our listeners. If you go to patreon.com slash talking Simpsons, sign up at the $5 level, you can get access to all of these shows one week at a time and ad free and also access everything behind the $5 paywall. That includes monthly episodes of Talking Futurama and Talking of the Hill, as well as access to over 100 episodes in our back catalog. We've covered things like Batman the Animated Series and The Critic and Mission Hill. You can hear us talk about those behind the paywall only at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. And there is a $10 level as well. If you sign up for that, you get all the $5 stuff, of course, but also access to one extremely long podcast once a month only for patrons at the $10 level or higher. And what is that, Henry? Bob is talking about the What A Cartoon Movie Podcast. You hear the free version of it in your feed every week. You just heard one for our Pinocchio What A Cartoon Movie where we talked about the Golden Age Disney classic. The month before that, we talked about South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, the 1999 time capsule. And at the end of this month, we're covering one that people have been wanting us to do for a very long time. It got nice. 96% in the poll to do this one. We've been wanting to do it, but do it justice. And that is Who Framed Roger Rabbit. That is coming at the end of this month. And you can only hear the, I'm sure, at least five hour long podcast once we do it. If you're at the $10 premium level at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons, head there today to check out over three years worth of a back catalog. I'd say 220, maybe 230 hours at this point of what a car two movies covering the gamut of everything from akira to a goofy movie spider-man into the spider-verse to beavis and butthead to america giant back catalog there check it all out at patreon.com slash talking simpsons and if you've never signed up for patreon before it's so easy to do when you sign up you're given a code you just drop that code into whatever you use to listen to podcasts and you can listen to all of our bonus podcasts the same way you listen to all of your regular podcasts on whatever app you like to use and there is also an app that patreon has for any smart device you might have if you download that you can listen to our bonus content that way as well. Either way you do it, it's so easy to access all the content waiting for you behind the paywall at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. Okay, guys, so grab a sub and get ready because it's now time for us talking about tape one school of Saturday morning all-star hits. A sub up, 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 up. Johnny Rash is the new face of Subby Buddy. Get a free CD of Johnny's Subby Buddy's exclusive single, A Sub Up, with your purchase of a six inch spicy bacon ranch. And don't forget to check out Johnny in the Skip and the Strongholds movie coming this fall. Uh, all I want to know is can I eat a sub? To, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the Randy theme song that took us in here. Just about that theme song. It's such a great parody of the feel of a Denver The Last Dinosaur parody song. While it really fits a lot of type of cartoons from that time. It's, it's a real sound alike. Yeah. Instead of Denver, it's Randy. The, yeah, I, I also love the... Uh, it's, it's almost like out of uh, Jump... The Van Halen song jump like, it ain't easy being big and green with teeth that look mean. But then it doesn't have the next line that goes, I ain't the worst that you've seen. Like, it doesn't do that. But uh, that, that's a bit of a Scooby-Doo moment in that uh, opening, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is like Denver was like Scooby-Doo through 20, like 20 years later. Like, well, there have been 20 years of Scooby-Doo ripoffs. What do we bring to this shitty Scooby-Doo ripoff of, of Denver, the last dinosaur? And I was not even a Denver viewer. Uh, in fact, I knew it was bad. Uh, mm. But I do enjoy this uh, this parody a lot. It's not even really a parody. 
parody. It just takes the premise and and kind of goes in a different direction. Mm-hmm. As as a kid, I loved the theme song, and then when it would start and all the teen stuff, I was like, eh, I I don't particularly care for. It. Though comparatively, it at least looked better than your typical Scooby Doo episode because Japanese people animated it. That's true. Yeah. Uh, but yes, okay, we're in the first episode, school, and yeah, I've just been thinking, we were recording this a few days after we did our, our interview with Scott, you just heard. I've just been thinking so much about what he told us and like how the universe of this, I appreciate so much more, like all the little breadcrumbs you can find even in this first episode, and just from the cha-chunk at the start, like, it's a nice, it's, it's a great aesthetic, and as a setup of like, oh, well, we can just skip between the sketches when we want to because the tape changes. Mm-hmm. But it also works as like, oh, somebody taped this off of TV. So there is a purpose. Like <laughs> you, you're trying to think about who taped this. Why did they tape this and not that? Like it's, I was thinking it's of magical. Henry's uh, Henry's tale of the tapes when things get cut off. Yes. Yeah. Trying yeah. to <laughs> uh, not record those commercials. And the, and the little moments of seeing the home movies, which shows you like whoever used this tape taped over home movies to make it i was waiting for that to be uh, a story Mm -hmm. uh thread but maybe it is but uh to me watching it again it really wasn't but i I like these little hints that like oh yeah somebody's recording over your you know a christmas (laughs) morning video or whatever Uh, with with this fucking garbage but it also is like it it does this only exists like in our world today you can just watch an episode of denver the last dinosaur but it's harder to find the footage of all the bullshit that was around it that was the feel of just all of watching a cartoon well or like the usa cartoon express or whatever i also uh this is spoilers for the end of the season but i wonder too if all of these are being taped by Catherine Logan, the little girl at the end hmm. who saves the day by taping the evidence oh, for him uh, that's against right. Johnny Rash. Like, I think now that you mentioned it, that must be heavily implied. Mm-hmm, I, I think so. That that's what we're watching. That's why it's edited to these ways. That's why in the last episode, it tapes the news report because it's like, oh, I was on TV. I'm going to tape this news report. But yeah, it, it shows the real heroes are the nerds who, the precocious <laughs> kids who taped television shows when they had VHSs. And if if there is more of the show, they could do an episode about like the podcasters of today who are now podcasting about Smash. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey. Or like having a Chip or Traybor call in on a Zoom call and they're, and they're like bald. <laughs> They've been through a lot. Oh, man. Boy, that's a really good idea. Hey, you know? I should be writing for these yeah. things. Kyle, if you want to hire some consultants for the... I, I'm just looking uh, for a way to put podcasting in any program that's uh, that, most that, our pitches yeah. i mean all that we have now is like there was that uh, zach braff show about a podcaster uh, uh marin the show about mark marin and then like podcast the ghostbuster yeah you know uh i don't know if kyle mooney wrote it but he was in a good recent snl skit about podcasting but it was about joe rogan podcasting which is certainly a a version of podcasting uh the joke was like it was the fisher price podcast uh, white guy podcaster set <laughs> which was basically like a fake mic that looks like a fisher price toy and you're as a white guy you're supposed to talk into it so it's not recorded and you don't get fired from a job oh nice yeah. so it's a way to get those ideas out safely yes yeah <laughs> but but anyway yeah the the uh tape begins perfectly to set it in time of like the 80s becoming the 90s with the uh, the mega mitten from nextronico which uh we the second you see you're like yeah power glove i got it yes yeah the terrible the true garbage of the power glove a total lie to told to us yeah. <laughs> and, and just like with the power glove there is uh like basically an nes gamepad on the on the forearm yes of, yeah. of the uh, of the mega mitten <laughs> and i you know i really wanted to see uh more nextronico game stuff in this series uh that that's one thing as a video game freak that i think uh, they could have done more with but hey the few things that we see i did enjoy yeah you know to make a fake video game that is like extra budget stuff stuff i get that but we see like the the fake dart video game that the, the mega mitten uh is used for it would have fit to see a create a no a strong almost video game yeah, like, yeah yeah but you know from a konami uh fake company or but yeah i mean uh, that would that would take some time or a mario a video game adaptation cartoon that would have been good too but hey you know there's only there's only so much budget i get it and this is a tie-in to uh the future movie trailer for the video game master that we'll see i I love that yeah 
Yeah, I and yeah, also the great casting on the kid with the Mega Mitten. Like he looks like one of the kids from like the Crossfire ad okay. when we were kids. I was thinking of Crossfire. <laughs> just especially the way the kid like looks up. Like I, it, it just reminds me of the look. If you don't, if you it, the we're gonna be saying a lot of references. It won't make sense if you didn't have our childhoods. But the Crossfire ad, just search Crossfire ad. You'll get caught up in the Crossfire. But even as a kid, I, I was savvy enough to think about the power glove. That can't possibly work. Yeah, yeah. I I know what technology is capable of in 1989, and I don't think it can do that. I think I must have had a friend who had it, and to find out that it sucked, and that was, you know, that's part of losing your innocence in our childhood, was realizing, like, wait, this commercial lied. It's not good. It's, in fact, bad. You know that 8-bit Christmas movie? Not so bad. It's it's uh, it's all right. The test for me, it's not great, but it's good. And it, my test at it, though, was they introduced the power glove into it and i was like well okay the power glove better be if this is actually their version of a christmas story then you need to be dis this needs to be an oval team level disappointment and it was oh wow so it was actually called the power glove the kid actually uses the power glove i guess mattel had to sign off on that and say you know what it was crap we're sorry <laughs> and the character actually says like the secret was though the power glove sucked uh <laughs> i guess super glove ball could have been pretty fun i never played it it was like the one thing it was made for it's like you're literally controlling a hand and like throwing a ball oh that's good yeah, but never, that's it though in the you know though in the movie they did have to make up like a fake fighting game that did not exist on the nes yeah that, which that kind of bugged me but all those peripherals were like you can play punch out with this and it's like well no punch out was designed for a controller uh, i mean the u-force was even worse get into that uh, oh also the next tronicos uh commercial i also love that it's like it's grays and reds and it's got like uh, the early nintendo this is not a toy kind of branding the same the same kind of thing that would have rob the robot in it the same the same style of it for sure uh you now you are one with the games uh and so then it's time for uh skip and Traybor to welcome us in here which i also love that this is from specifically channel 58 that we get the local news spot as well that's that's so great like when you see youtube uploads of just you know any old commercial like when i was looking for old commercials for adventures of sonic they ended with only on fox 5 or whatever you know the framing device of this uh once we get to the end of these episodes it actually makes me gives me a sense of melancholy because i remember at the end of saturday morning it's like oh no it's 11 30 <laughs> uh what's up next nba inside stuff or golf or something right. like that it's just like well the, the party's over go play uh, an old nintendo game you've played a million times now man you're right yeah when that farewell comes like that is the sadness of like the, there's well and there's no more cartoons because what is there supposed to be a cartoon network out to the air not gonna happen yeah what am i supposed to do talk to my parents <laughs> hang Go out with outside? them absolutely not yeah. uh but uh i would guess this is at about at 8 a.m uh programming begins with skip and trebor whoa what's up kids i'm skip and i'm trebor and we're the new hosts of smash saturday morning oh star hits wait if it's saturday why are we at school because we're finally gonna make school fun by adding TV! Whoa. If this is school, then I say more detention, please. <laughs> Today's assignment. Watch the totally tubular cartoonage. We got smashing at you. Plus, we got a super sizzling sneak peek at the new Johnny Rash movie. Yeah, and I've got a sneak peek at the doggy dance. Skip <laughs> your dog on crazy. Bark, 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 bark. We'll be right bark. I mean, back after an all new episode of Ray. I just love they always keep note of that because at the end of the episode, only one of them does the ah at the end of it. Like, <laughs> you know, going back to this, I, I confess to Scott Gardner and to you, I didn't know these were both Kyle Mooney. And going back to and watching it again, I'm like, it's still kind of hard for me to tell because <laughs> I don't I don't think like I never thought the technology was there to have these people like darting in front of each other and to have like the motion right? control camera, like memorize all the movements. I thought like still like if you wanted to film uh, one person as two characters, you have to lock the camera down and maybe 
maybe it's like a Back to the Future thing where it can kind of pan back and forth. But I guess I underestimated technology. It's it's amazing technology to learn that from Scott. Like I I would have figured I don't know if I had to like figure it out afterwards. I would have figured oh maybe they just did a big wide shot and then they later edited zoom ins together. But but no that they did just one take and like okay the computer memorized how the computer moved and you have to match up with it like that that is like movie magic it's, really it's, it's moony magic too because <laughs> yes. he does a great job of playing off of himself like i've seen a lot of this kind of thing where a character uh is sorry an actor is playing off of like pre-recorded footage and there's sometimes like it you can tell they're not looking in the right direction or there's too much of a delay i don't know what he was looking at or if it was just intuition but it's perfect <laughs> it's all perfect yeah. like you believe they're both in the same space oh man i also just love uh, you can see the character dynamic at play even in this very first scene like where they're so similar but i noted that like trebor is trying to stay on topic and he's like and yes we're also going to have the new johnny rash movie while meanwhile skip is just being silly like and i'm going to do the doggy dance like <laughs> yeah when you watch it for the first time you take all this at face value it's like oh they're doing like this very easy shtick but then when you go back you can see like oh no i can see the characters emerging skip is definitely like vamping mm. doing like little quips and trey is like sticking to the script yeah and it also shows like why why skip was always going to be the breakout star because trey Bohr, like isn't isn't as charismatic like not in front but also i think that it shows that skip needs trey Bohr to balance him out because like he needs trey Bohr to be the straight man so skip can be silly and funny and do the say zuzzy's ass and do the doggy dance and all that there really needs to be a wikipedia entry for all of these types of characters because when we were talking to scott i was thinking of you know cody on step by step and bill and ted and i was also thinking oh yeah game pro tv had one of those right like and i'm Brennan. we're gonna talk about all the coolest video games today and the other guy was just like nerd jd roth right man oh man and do you remember too the uh when they redid the super mario brothers super show with two cool guys hosting it instead of uh the lou alpano yes yes it was like that was like club mario yeah yeah it was like chip and pepper's uh clones (laughs) yeah well though i think it was interracial that well because i got the feel the african-american actor who plays the dj in the repackaging of smash as like a live show i gotta feel like he was being asked to per- act like the cool black guy from the club mario as well oh absolutely yeah yeah but uh, man it's just so so great and you can also tell that like using this show to advertise uh the johnny rash movie it shows that the executive who loves skip also loves johnny rash and it was always going to be them together <laughs> not, and trey Bohr will be is is just uh, a package deal with skip skip this is his like launching pad to to fame uh to hear that was so great to hear from Scott that it's like, yeah, this is inspired by how an NBC executive, Brandon Tartikoff, just <laughs> did whatever he felt like. He's like, you're a movie star now. He was a kingmaker. Yeah. He, it's, I was thinking to him, like, what Brandon Tartikoff stories that I heard? And one of them was the uh, news radio, like, he kind he loved, hated it. And uh, when Paul Sims, like, did some interview in Rolling Stone saying, like, yeah, the executives suck and they're going to cancel the show. I just know it. Uh, Brandon Tartikoff, I believe was the guy who had the actual like joke boss reaction of you got moxie kid i'm gonna Mm. renew you for another season (laughs) like they couldn't believe it oh by the way i was looking up the names of the characters on the club mario another one of these where they like you said henry they were repackaging old deke nintendo cartoons Mm. it's uh tommy tree hugger was the skip slash trebor style character and co mc was the uh the dj guy all right co mc wow that's (laughs) yeah that guy was such a a skip that and that also like what we love about smash is how it captures the feel of the 80s becoming the 90s and this weird transitional period club mario is a perfect version of that because in the late 80s they thought well yeah we'll just have like two you know guys in their 40s 50s dress up as mario and luigi they'll host these things and then a couple of years later they're like that's not cool kids don't like that they need somebody cool with a like uh, <laughs> and just the the, and I, the idea of uh things being hosted is such an old idea that we we live through the last era of this yeah. is like these guys are like the bozo the clowns <laughs> of this uh 
of this package. We don't really do this anymore. I mean, like, I think the cable station Me TV has a, a cartoon package where it's hosted by a guy in like this fish puppet, but that's a throwback to old timey hosted right. cartoon shows. But it really was petering out in this era. Now, MST3K was like the postmodern version of it, which uh, we're recording this on the day of the premiere of the 13th season of MST3K on the for, for that's right. Kickstarters. I'm like, a Gizmonic cadet or whatever, whatever that is. I gave him $100. Yeah, me, me and you were like, you know what? We have enough money to now finally just give Joel a Joel and everybody <laughs> else 100 bucks. I got to pay my Joel bill this year. I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad they went outside of Netflix finally. I think that messed yeah. up their season 11 in a way that, uh, anyway, as we talk about this wonderful Netflix show. <laughs> um, but yeah, the uh, so they throw to Randy and uh, I just love the cut to the opening theme and yeah, it absolutely has the feel of like a Ruby Spears thing, trying to be cool and hip with the time, even though it is a warmed over idea from 1969 with Scooby-Doo. It's just, it's Scooby-Doo, but for like 1987. And now this is 1991 when you're watching it and it's kind of tired. Like that was great to have that confirmed by As the show begins, you're supposed to see stuff like Creative Crittles and Randy feeling old, like they're not the cool thing anymore. This mm-hmm. is like seeing Care Bears in the early 90s, you know? Yeah, the Creative Crittles are very much, they have Care Bears energy. The Strong Animals do feel more more like oh here's your 90s cartoon yeah yeah here's your like ninja turtles uh kind of rip off i think it's twisted by an emerging star but you know once you know the story of randy this opening does tell his story like he's teleported down he instantly gets a skateboard and uh and then him and like the fat kid steals the pizza while he's on a date uh, rocco <laughs> and yeah i think this is ends up being though th- see this is what i love about smash is that they perfectly capture like this is a pair of denver the last dinosaur and we can all like laugh like ah i do remember that and then smash cuts to a story about the difficulties of like (laughs) growing up but not knowing what you're doing and you're kind of fucking up and you're in a bad relationships that with all of your high school friends that are like curdling and you don't know what to do and you're just kind of lost like it's so so well done and i also like how the premise doesn't make a lot of sense i mean in denver uh these teens find an egg and it's hatched and that's why he's the last dinosaur uh, Randy is not the last dinosaur. Uh, actually, you can see Newton in the intro, but then when he's revealed, it's like a, it was a big laugh for me where it's yeah. like when Randy says, I'm not even the last dinosaur, and then Newton appears. And everyone hates him. <laughs> to know that the show has ruined its own, like the, the show within the show being that they've ruined their own uniqueness with it and they've kind of written themselves into a corner at this point and the writers the writers don't know what they're doing uh and yeah i mean this i uh man i had so many high school friendships that turned toxic like this as we went into college age like this captures it too well honestly like i knew some randys i like to think that i was usually the michael uh in this the guy trying to make it all work and be like no guys come on you're he's a good guy you know and yeah his 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 girlfriend or his ex is right like randy needs to work on himself yeah yeah he's looking for someone to be his mom but, but also like heather kind of can't leave him that she does she does love him and feels bad for him but both of them just need to move on with their lives but they're kind of scared to and, uh, and yes heather is voiced by movie star emma stone uh, really yes yeah who who is the wife of dave mccary the, oh. uh, the live action director of this so yeah i i, I was not aware of that wow i think it's funny that me and you interview scott and we didn't have one question about emma stone no, or no. paul rudd <laughs> we're like yeah yeah movie stars whatever like what about frank wilker <laughs> yes uh, i want more lamarche uh, secrets did maurice lamarche have funny stories about playing egon did he do the orson welles impression <laughs> i'm sure he did but what i mean man that great opening then telling you like and also the opening kind of is saying like no randy's great just give him a chance like he's actually good you might think randy looks like a jerk but no he's the greatest pal around really he is and then just smash cut to this awkward scene uh in the car god this breakup is so great with him shoved into the seat as this giant dinosaur i I love the design of him too where he's supposed to look cool but he also looks just kind of pathetic too yes just like the droopy like dino dreads he has or whatever (laughs) and his backwards cap and he yeah that he used to wear well you see that when he like first teleported in he was you know naked i think too well i think of him saying that he's never been comfortable in his body like he's adding layers because he feels 
feels like i feel kind of like fat and weird in this world like everything's i'm too big for everything <laughs> doesn't like himself no no general. pants though yes yeah <laughs> uh but yes randy is broken up with so that's just it then i guess so would you want to like take some time away from each other and and maybe just s- see where we're at i don't think so randy but I-, I could be better i think this is just how it has to be i really do love you so much love you too <laughs> four point seven two hundred north main street <laughs> I should go. Yeah. Uh oh. Oh. Okay. Uh, no, just my legs are getting kind of cut on this. <laughs> Your tail's hitting me. Damn it. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Well, see ya. I also like the the fun addition is that would be the gag for him on a, the regular version of this where it's like his tail knocks something over and people go Randy but he causes him a lot of pain mm-hmm. in lots of awkward situations it embarrasses him sometimes it kills people like, yeah. yeah that he's all of the things would be oh Randy but it like the joke's over for him he's he just feels empty and sad all the time like just God his sad walk is he's like walking by all the fun kid stuff he used to enjoy like he walks by the skate ramp he walks by the baseball diamond he doesn't feel anything and he's just like dreams of death like he just <laughs> wants to kill him. there's two two different suicide bits in this like and and yeah that randy has suicidal ideation and just this great bit about like the futility of like everybody around him knows he feels this bad but what what can you do like what do you say to this person mm-hmm. like how do you get around it especially this like from the opening you see that the professor sort of is his surrogate dad but he's like well i'm not really your dad and like well you can live in the you know basement or whatever i guess uh you know i also was thinking of that that show croc from our kids uh youth because croc the the caveman oh crow crow yeah croc sorry crow about the caveman boy because it was stories being told by a mastodon who lived now oh right oh yeah the the theme song look up the crow theme song it takes a wild (laughs) swerve it's like wait a minute what's the show about and because I, as a kid, I did think of like, wouldn't that, wouldn't that fuck up that mastodon to be alive now and know that everybody he ever knew is dead, <laughs> like for a long time ago. Let me share their stories. Uh, but yes, and here Randy just lives in his shitty basement that he never, that he never made look any better either. But then, yeah, just this exchange is is very funny with Randy and and uh, Doctor K. Heather. No, uh, uh, Michael's upstairs. Just tell him I'm not here. I hate myself. What was that? (laughs) Nothing. I said I hate myself. Okay, I I can't quite make it out, but uh, it sounds like you're saying that you don't like yourself. No. Didn't say I don't like myself. I said I hate myself. Now it sounds like you're sort of uh, quietly correcting me, and I'm just very concerned about <laughs> you, Randy. All right, Doctor Cattrellberg. Seems like you fixed me. Really? No. All right. Well, just take care of yourself. I forgot to tell you one thing, Doctor K. That I wish I was <laughs> extinct. <laughs> his and his like fun hangout is just like, a mattress on the floor surrounded by beer cans it's oh. not it's not like the crazy randy uh, pad you think it would be yeah it's it's really depressing like he never got a better you can see why he hates himself so much he's just surrounded by filth all the time you do but this even puts you in the feeling of the rest of his friends and his and his father figure of just like god randy like just get it together like but he, he, he can't Th- this in the next uh cartoon uh 
Creative Critters. They both have similar premises that I like, uh, but I wish they were spread apart more because they are a little too similar in that this is what happens after the fun adventures are over. Like, you see the intro and that Randy, they're in a band, they're like investigating haunted houses, but now Rand, all the fun is over. Randy has to be an adult and he can't do that. <laughs> and with right. Creative Critters, we'll get to it later, but it's like, well, the little boy grew up mm-hmm. and he has, still has his attachment to these to these weird friends <laughs> who he can't get rid of. Uh, he can't he can't stop. Yeah, yeah. in this case, like, the other kids, they're still kind of young but randy should go to college like it's like being friends like if you were like 13 and friends with a 17 year old and then like your friend's older brother and then your friend's older brother like didn't leave for college and just kind of keeps hanging around and it gets sadder and sadder and you're asking yourself like boy don't i feel should i help him but also i don't want to be like this guy randy's becoming a real townie (laughs) uh so yeah the the kids try come over they want him to come out and play i mean michael is great like he's clearly the leader of the group but he also wants everybody to be happy like i just love all his asides to randy like come on randy it's okay man (laughs) like it's and then meanwhile Cree summer she's playing shauna which is the exact kind of like shallowly written one black girl in the group that she probably had to play like in 800 different cartoons and it's like wow she can still do that voice uh like 30 years after i first heard it that's why she'll you know she can be the a little kid forever that's why she's got uh like that is a job for life in Mm -hmm. that case like that is a sustainable career and uh yes rocco the fat kid showing up eating a sub sandwich our first reference to subs in this series which that's great you know uh on on our interview with scott uh you thought he was doing the voice but i think like there's some temp scott lines at least one of them is still in as as rocco i heard scott's voice i agree i think that i think it's beck bennett in this one but i do believe when rocco says i don't appreciate that and i want it to stop i think that's scott mm. i don't i don't want to make scott have to go back and change <laughs> and fix, a, Up, fix upload a, a new file <laughs> yeah get beck bennett back in that studio he's not busy uh but yeah that in this world just like how we saw this in street sharks and every other thing we've covered that copied ninja turtles you can't just do pizza because they did pizza sonic has to have chili dogs even though it makes sense like yeah pizza makes the most sense for all kids but you can't just rip off turtles and have pizza and in this case it's sub sandwiches like and that, that's a, a funny choice because it's just a lot of food and it's like very complicated yes. and it's not like something you can eat on the go i guess chili dogs is like maybe one extra ingredient and pizza is just like yeah just a piece of pizza but yeah sub is just a very funny choice (laughs) yeah and just subs is a funny word i just love to hear people say subs in so many different ways is so great uh but yes all the kids are begging randy to come in and yeah though this also feels like you know you know does randy want to feel better and his friend are his friends helping him are they just demanding that he join in with them so they feel better Mm. and that like oh did did things feel normal again because randy he's hanging out with them you well, know some not, i've never done this but some friend groups have the the friend who they uh include just because that the makes them feel better about themselves it's like oh sure well, this guy is a total fucking mess oh yes yeah hey well i i know what you're talking about yes <laughs> yeah uh, but i this is just a quick one but after randy comes out he then does make a giant mess and and they think things are back to normal hey randy come on let's live our lives only young one. Come on, let's play. The whole thing here. Randy, 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 Randy. I told you guys, he's still the same old Randy. <laughs> 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 oh, buddy. Saturday morning all star hits will return after these messages. Okay, but Randy sobbing into the commercial break that is yeah. also just great, and they're trying to comfort him. I mean, it, it's something they do a few times on the show, but it always makes me laugh. Just like mm-hmm. the hard cut into something much more lighthearted <laughs> from something very dark. Uh, but like, just that everybody's like, "See, Randy, everything's back to normal," and he just laughs into crying, like, "Oh, oh man, I'm, I'm sorry, Randy. I'm sorry. Oh God." And the and then just yeah, the the moment of it, like that Rogo ad, like just like yeah. the four seconds of it, like what is this? 
this like it's probably jeans it looks like jeans like the perfect graphic design for like 1991 too uh and uh yeah this this sketch that follows it in the in the library like there's a million sketches like that in kids tv programming yeah like you hey you calm down little dude like yeah uh yeah just taking down the stuffy doll and you can see that uh in in the writing of this in the fictional world uh trebor is being cast as a less fun character yeah but even like up until the end of this episode he's he's like playing along with it even though he's he's playing the character who constantly gets insulted he's just like yeah it's part of the bit yeah but then like his feelings seriously get hurt at the end (laughs) yeah at first you think like oh they maybe they get trade positions like then uh you know trebor gets to uh shine in one sketch but no and i guess too it even comes down to like their names like skip is a cool name trebor is a dumb name and he should go by trey like it's a oh absolutely it's not a star name it's it's no pepper (laughs) it makes you wonder like why do you go by trebor go by trey don't be trey trebor is a dumb name (laughs) uh but yeah he's like can't you read the sign can't you read the sign and just uh like rules don't be quiet lots of no scratched out eating i like one of the rules is lots of eating lots of he's eating a sub though too right i thought so more more subs the subs being uh, baked in here and also part of like the advertising i like too that in the world there's multiple sub companies like there's bumpies and subbies and uh, it's like uh when you'd watch some like when we watch the teenage mutant ninja turtle live action movie in the movie they advertise dominoes but then in the vhs tape it was ads for pizza hut because right. pizza hut got the rights i was used to seeing the pizza hut in the video games yeah, so yeah. i was confused by all the uh you know contradictory branding and pizza hut really bought into the coming out of our shells tour mm-hmm. which uh, i know scott is a big fan oh absolutely of well. i also just love when trey border throws to the next thing he's like let's just watch more randy yeah and then it stays for like an extra awkward second yeah yeah i i love the uh you could tell this is not being done by people who uh care yes. you know the yeah. editing and so just like let's just shoot these remotes with these two losers for uh you know an hour in this school and and don't care about making trebor look good like definitely the the executive producer on the show doesn't like trebor <laughs> either uh so yes it comes back to randy and this again is just this great perfect encapsulation of like young pals growing up who don't understand relationships but they think they can like just as he explains like well yeah here's all the ways in which i'm a loser they go like ah chicks are dumb you know who knows man i can't make sense of these people <laughs> and when we meet digit here yes um, oh, played by digit. pamela adlon correct yes yeah i i love i love, yeah, let's hear it let's hear it here wait so she was just like we're not doing this anymore i guess it was sort of like we got our whole lives ahead of us and because i like live in a museum basement and i <laughs> don't kiss her as much anymore <laughs> and i get drunk a lot i'm maybe not a good partner what does she mean that's dumb <laughs> girl's a weird dude by my calculations she doesn't deserve you <laughs> thanks digit well we're psyched to have you back man thanks guys i mean i, I guess she's sort of right i've never really pushed myself Maybe because I'm like a dinosaur? I mean, I left the only world I knew, got zapped into the future where I'm the last of my kind, then I find out I'm not even the last of my kind. You guys should be wearing helmets. (laughs) Shut up, Newton. Go away, Newton. I'll seriously kick your butt, dude. (laughs) Plus, I never told you guys, but I've never really been comfortable with my body. Whoa, a house party. (laughs) (laughs) Randy is trying he's reaching out and they they don't care he's finally starting to open up I mean you can see in this dynamic you're like Michael's Michael's trying to listen to him a little Shauna is just like chicks are crazy man I don't know and then Digit's just like by my calculations you're by uh, like you're cool and the calculator says Randy rocks and then meanwhile you've got Rocco is his worst influence like first that when they could be listening to Randy as he's finally opening up about what troubles him he just goes like house party man and then at the house party he's the one who sees Randy being sad and alone and he's like you could use a friend and then passes him the beer 
beer bong and just get some drunk. You know, I've been to a plenty of parties in my day, never a sip of the beer bong. No, me neither. No, it's like you, you, the red cup's fine enough for me, you know. But yeah, I just love his the all the things he describes. This is why you're a bad partner. You're a, you live in a museum basement. You don't <laughs> kiss her as much. You're shiftless. You get drunk all the time. I find out later he doesn't brush his teeth. He just splashes the water uh, around. Thinks about video games, <laughs> man. I I also love the by my calculations thing just builds and builds until he like he can't take it anymore he's sick of digit like he never even liked digit <laughs> but yeah just and then again they show newton uh, just to be like yeah this show doesn't even have its own premise anymore he's not the only dinosaur he's not even special randy's feeling empty because he's not even the only dinosaur and yeah a lot of this is just like very realistically observed like troubled friends where it's just like well you know uh, he's depressing but he's more fun when he drinks but then if he drinks too much well then it just gets kind of weird yeah. and we, we want to leave we want to you, leave you all feel a little uncomfortable the way he like his thing about like humans got lucky like it's close to your friend saying like look man i'm just saying about mexicans you know yeah. like so it, and you're all just like hey it's it's cool man it reminds me of also uh the very realistically observed dirtbag from uh bart to the future a bad simpsons episode but that character is good where everything is everyone else's fault he yeah. didn't do anything it's just like well i could have all this stuff but you know i keep getting screwed over <laughs> oh man and the way that like everybody is worried he's a, when he's doing his handstand michael's like why don't we just like calm down he's like i'm cool man i'm cool like also that in the middle of this party there's like a weird science thing happening yeah they create a woman <laughs> that's so funny. Digit creates a woman uh, oh that movie yikes Yo, man, yeah. When I, I, I saw that in a movie theater like a decade ago, I was like, oh, this has this is terrible opinions about women. <laughs> Especially after the big house party, when the girl he tricked uh, into one of the guys uh, tricked into a date, she's like, I love you because you tried to trick me. It shows no. you care. Like, yeah. Again, very well observed of like the way Randy is just kind of like sitting on the floor in the hallway <laughs> in the thing. It's like, oh, yeah, that's a sad guy in a, in a house party. Like, and sometimes you're sometimes you are that sad guy and sometimes you're just looking at that sad guy thinking especially oh, i feel sad for him if there's no dog to play with hey, oh man you're fucked i miss us and, uh, and then somebody picks up a guitar that's the one thing missing here nobody randy would be the guy who'd be like oh a keyboard and he'd start playing a song uh, and yeah, they tease that he's going to break that vase, but instead he kicks a cigarette out of somebody's hand <laughs> and starts a deadly fire. <laughs> I like in the next episode we go like, oh, I guess I killed that guy. I should probably call his parents, but he doesn't because he's a dirtbag. Uh, but yes, a giant fire breaks out. That's when Heather arrives, and uh, yeah, throughout this whole thing. I just love that like death and fire is happening everywhere and they're barely paying attention to it and it's instead just a passive aggressive ex breakup exchange like, especially as she's like reviving children while talking to him oh man that he and then so perfect that like it captures that Randy misreads Newton's behavior and he thinks that Newton and Heather together are are together when they're not but it's like Newton Newton I think does want it and mm -hmm. Heather doesn't <laughs> because Newton is a creepy crime scene photographer like he's not a good he really guy. is he's peeking under those blankets yeah he's you shouldn't want to get with newton either but uh but yeah this a sad end for old randy in the first episode here you can't take that blanket with you <laughs> <laughs> you okay no yeah i'm i'm fine it's just <sighs> he's so frustrating i know He's such a great dinosaur, but... He can also be a jerk who spends so much time lounging on the couch you'd think he was supermodel Sasha Sinclair sunbathing on an exotic beach. There you go, little buddy. I don't think he's gonna make it. It's like he could do anything he wanted if he just got out of his own way. I made it! Like, seriously, he could go to school for doing drum machines. If I could weigh in here... Go home, Newton! I guess Randy just gotta make his own choices. That's what hurts me most. Just standing on the sidelines, watching him mess up his whole life. But I'm not his mom, and I'm not his shrink, and maybe I shouldn't be his girlfriend. You should make sure your friend's okay. You're a good person, Heather. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> and the music comes back in there. Uh, love that. In the, in the world credits, I always love when there's like a junior in there of just like, oh, hey, that's somebody's son <laughs> yeah. who like was given a job. I, I like the idea of going to school for doing drum machines. Yeah. It's just uh, like when you're trying to find help for someone aimless, it's like, uh, you can do that. You can go to school for that, right? Uh, and it actually is in this world, it's a drum machine school. It really exists. Like also just the little things of like when Randy shoves past them to leave after he tells her she actually sucks at dancing he kind of knocks uh newton to one f uh, like to his knee and newton kind of looks back like man and he's like okay are you gonna are you gonna do something about it or just let it go but i also you know i've been in those situations too where somebody says you know he is a good guy like if he could just get out of his own way and i look back on that and for half those guys i'm like no yeah i don't think so i think we were all telling <laughs> ourselves that i i had a i i had a, I had a high school friend like this who mm. i do believe he is still uh uh well he's still working on that drum machine let's say and <laughs> he's still uh, working on his drum machine degree yes yeah and i believe uh has uh you know he's just kind of staying with his parents for now you know just how it goes sometimes. it's really a five-step plan yeah yeah and, and actually he's not a sellout like me but, <laughs> uh, that guy sucked I, I don't miss that guy when he walked the way that michael guy that michael is the key of this thing like he's the guy trying to keep it all together i almost for a second thought michael i think michael actually is just friends with heather but i kept thinking by the end of the randy arc that heather and michael would end up together mm. like it has uh, a happier ending than i was suspecting yes yeah which which i guess the the message for randy at the end of his story is like just stop hanging out with your high school friends you did grow past them and it's okay to grow past people sometimes mm -hmm. and move on like stop stop hanging out with all of your same friends when you were 18 because the, you're all moving in different directions or you should be yeah the only thing though, the reason your friend is because you were in the same school district yeah yeah i no, i mean uh those those high school friends i i check in on them on facebook some of them some of them still hanging out with each other some of them moved to other places uh sadly some uh a randy type person no longer with us passed mm. away in the in the covid era killed by a drum machine <laughs> but uh, fell on him uh but yeah in this uh in this case randy sadly walks away oh and i also love her way of saying like you can't take that blanket with you like that's <laughs> such a great like she's trying to get a win on him but can't uh and so yes then cut to the strongables commercial setting up the strongables we're gonna see it really does capture 80s toy commercial kind of style like the listing of all the things kickaroo's fingernails really grow yeah i like the escalation that it starts with uh a real, what could be a realistic toy where it's like oh yeah the, the tiger has the whip attack but then everything else is like a, a bad feature <laughs> like drog has a real feeling tongue and uh Gwinja is one of those toys you kind of have to ruin to use him where you have yeah. to put water in him and freeze him it reminded me of like i wasn't one of those little rich boys that had the ghostbusters headquarters thing but my friend <laughs> did and uh it came with like a thing of slime but like we never wanted to use the slime it's like you're gonna ruin your toy if you dump a oh. bunch of slime on it because it was built with great so the slime could like drip down to different floors and stuff like yeah. how do you clean up that slime <laughs> you know i had the i had the he-man castle gray skull he had that too and i had i had this was a regular henry friend i had i had the turtle van uh yeah that too but Wait, I, where, did you live in northeast ohio <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't have the Ghostbusters house, though. Yeah. I didn't have that. But yeah, I never liked those slime toys. A cousin of mine, he had the, like, it was the slime torture chamber that He-Man had of, like, uh, in a very S&M kind of way, you chain up He-Man and then <laughs> drop slime on him. All over his face. Yes. <laughs> but, but the slime, yeah, I was never into that slime stuff. But I would freeze my toys occasionally. Mm. Like, I would say, like, oh, Scrooge. Uh, the ones I definitely did was Darkwing Duck. Probably, I think, because he got frozen in episodes of Darkwing Duck. I got, like, uh, not the full Darkwing Duck figure, but the the figurine that came in a Fruit Loops. Okay. I would freeze that in a cup, and I think I broke a glass one time, and my mom had to explain to me, like, you can put plastic in there, but if you put a glass in there, the ice expands and breaks the glass, Henry. So it was, it was a fun science lesson. <laughs> but Gwinja is just like, he's a one ice cube ice cube tray. And, like, <laughs> leave him overnight, and he makes ice ice and just the way that little cube of ice plops out it's very like, unceremoniously but the kids are like whoa <laughs> whoa now these and yeah the the uh the play sets well not even play sets the, the environments these toys are playing on are just like what you'd see in all the commercials where it's like you can't buy these yes they're like basically fake mountains and things like bust through the rocks and the kids have access to all of this like basically it looks like you're you got like a warhammer game going on <laughs> yeah like a kid for them to play with all their gi joes they set up all these lincoln laws 
logs are like i set up a bunch of blocks for batman to bust through you can't buy those blocks kids but just just imagine that's how you play with it that's i think eventually by the 90s they maybe legally or had to put in a thing at the bottom like these things not included exactly like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, after that commercial we then cut away to skip and trebor again skip making fun of trebor it's <laughs> very one-sided like hey that's rude <laughs> I, I this this feels like a kid's like street joke or something where i swear to god this is probably on like you can't do that on television and like welcome freshman yes, and clarissa yeah. explains it all just like an easy way to fill 20 seconds of your kid's <laughs> show and i i swear i've heard this a billion times that's the point where it's yeah. just like the easiest like setup and punchline you just use it you know it's like yeah on saved by the bell they reused a million jokes on that show like yeah. they weren't they didn't write new jokes why would you bother so then we go to the creator critters which yet yeah, it starts with like the magic and whimsy of a crystal ball and now you know in the care bears as a kid care bears got uh further and further away from its premise but i remember watching the first care bears and it's like they live in heaven with like a cloud car guy yeah and, there's like a very weird like christian undertone so that yeah, that never sat right with me yeah which eventually they got rid of but yeah this uh, but when they fly up into the clouds in this uh, especially in the last episode like oh there's the there's the heavenly stuff with the creator critters but I, I was never a care bears kid i think because my sister was uh, because uh she was into the things that were around like at, when i was way too young to watch them like strawberry shortcake and uh, rainbow bright and care bears so like none of that was on the table for me uh, i i loved uh, i liked care bears my uh i had one care bear stuffed ki- uh, toy as a kid that i that i would hug to go to sleep that was tender heart who is the leonardo slash optimus <laughs> prime of the group i have other people say they never liked the leonardo or optimus prime of groups i usually liked the leader of groups in, in those cartoons and and this show in general uh, does a really great job of naming things and i love uh, the term crittles which is not a word <laughs> right it's just yes. like yeah critters is a word but i like that they're create a crittles it's like little plus critter and crittles yeah it's such a weird word and and yeah like you said this is similar to randy except this is when you're friends with the create other creative people in your 20s and as you enter your 30s you grow up in different directions and that relationship does it is about a toxic relationship of once good friends yeah <laughs> yeah and especially like uh i mean there's there's no shame in, in doing art for the sake of you know expression but like sometimes you have friends and it's like their art's not very good but they still want you to engage with it and you're just like you should do something else yeah. but i remember like i wasn't friends with these guys but uh i was in an anime club uh and you just would overhear <laughs> conversations people were having and uh one of these guys you could re- this really places in time when i went to college just one of these guys was saying to his friends guys you know i've been writing these uh lone gunman fanfics and no one's reading them and i think he'd be a lot more supportive of me oh, lone gunman was the x-file spinoff oh man so he was just like uh, chastising his friends for not being supportive of his uh, lone gunman fanfic oh wow, man and it, it, it doesn't the, the guys like uh especially brusho in this comes off so perfectly of the guy who's less successful than you in your artistic group who thinks he should be more successful than you and he was kind of shoving in your face like you know i'm actually the better artist than you and hey i'm kidding keep doing your corporate crap you know yeah uh but here let's hear the creative crittles opening once upon a time a struggling young artist by the name of david nubbins stumbled upon magical creatures They taught him the true potential of creativity. Little did David know, he started a friendship that could never end. The world just isn't ready for the creator critters. So David must keep them a secret from everyone especially his family it's so well animated yeah that's, that's one thing uh this gets wrong about the care bears is that this has actual good animation <laughs> yeah they though they do capture the like the opening was always the best animated thing of anything when that's we true. were kids but no even the openings to care bears care bears always look like shit like it was not a good looking cartoon it's show. an interesting challenge for the animators to make something that looks bad but it's also to be appealing to the netflix viewer but also they have to put like a filter over it like yeah. a vhs filter so there's a lot going on here <laughs> and 
and yeah, the description of the, the setup of like, and David can't let anyone know, but it's not like the world is ruined by the creative criddles being known. Like he, it's more just that his re- marriage will be over. That's what will happen if, if people find out about the creative criddles. They, they eventually get hired by human beings. <laughs> it's not like an elf secret, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, it's more like he just keeps them to himself. And uh, I really love the, the character of David that he is this, everybody kind of fucks with him and he's just is like nervous like i i uh our, our pal scott i especially with him being with the david character being a new father oh yeah i, I could see a little of our of, of scott gardner's real life in there just uh, just a teeny bit i also think of uh pals in our lives in in the relationship dynamics of where uh we don't have kids some friends then do have kids and you sometimes you feel like the <laughs> criddles trying to have fun with your friend who does have to be a parent now yeah come on just one more cream soda yeah come on i have a cool hey i know your kid is like needs a father or whatever but i have problems too <laughs> listen about my podcast come on honestly when he has to go out to the uh the shed i was thinking like these are his friends doing a podcast in a shed oh absolutely like, come on, yeah come do the podcast <laughs> i also really love that not only does is he a new father but cree summer plays his wife with a british or like fancy accent which i really love that choice yeah it's just like for no reason and i was like okay sure why not yes yeah that she's it shows i think that she is a higher class than him and she's kind of well not slumming it but like she maybe is too good for him but she is nice and supportive we find out later that like she actually is the typical to our friend group as well where the the spouse makes uh is actually more successful and makes more money than david and david is just a creative goofball husband yeah. she loves the creative yeah. partner is not picking up the slack as yeah. much as the person with the real job but she's really rooting for him though but yeah we find out that like yeah she's super well well-paid architect who designed the house they live in. <laughs> uh, it, it, I, it like it's a very childish view of jobs because it's like everyone was an architect uh, on TV yeah. uh, when I was growing up, and also every job is like I got a big meeting tomorrow. Oh, I right. got a presentation. <laughs> we were always worried that that was going to be our. You know, then it was like no, there's meetings every single day, and none of them matter. That's yeah, that's yeah. what our working. <laughs> there there were was. no stakes at all. Uh, but yes, David has to meet up with the Criddles. Criddles, hello. <laughs> David, we thought you bailed on us. Sorry I'm late, Brusho. I've just been really busy today. You want to snip us out of your life? Of course not, Sizzy. Look, I love you guys. You give my life so much... Color. (laughs) RGB, you said it. So here we are, my three best friends. Oh, right! Pesto! My eyes put me from now. Pesto, come here. Let me help you out with that. Thank you, David. Oh, oh no, look at this. I ruined your project. <laughs> no, you didn't ruin it. You fixed it. Yeah, and you mixed up all the colors. <laughs> this is why I love you guys. You're so creative. You aren't afraid to make a big mess. Because that's where you find the masterpiece. <laughs> I, I love that they're working their mission statement into this little thing yeah. where it's like he's, he's had to have heard this a lot, right? <laughs> oh man, I just love the, the, the reality of the creative kernels. They have this design that makes a good toy of like their hands are the thing they use for art. Yeah. But then they have to show like, well, how do you live like that? Just seeing- it seems <laughs> awful, especially uh, Pesto. I-, I love his dopey voice. Yes. And I love yeah. how when you see everyone's doing something creative and when, when you see Pesto, he's like just jabbing at the tape deck with his glue stick <laughs> hands. He's, he's the dopey idiot of the group, which sets it up even better that like he's the, the lesser dude in the group who then actually excels beyond everybody <laughs> else later. He's the most tortured artist among them with his one man uh, show but he sounds stupid and everybody d- underestimates him also i mean even david goes like yeah my three best friends wait pesto like even he's just overlooking <laughs> pesto and i also like sizzy the way she says like trying to cut us out of your life like just that she's being passive aggressive already like oh you showed up late probably because you don't like us anymore right but they're all like, doing puns based on their like abilities yeah oh god and, and also seeing rgb with his pain Paint hands dipping them into uh paint cans like that doesn't make sense <laughs> and yeah that they the, that cardboard ro- 
Robot, it all pays off. This all really does pay off across mm-hmm. the four Criddles episodes. David doesn't want to stay out too late, and his friends pressure him into staying out and just go like, ah, just a little bit longer. When they know they, if they get him to stay for like one drink, he's staying all night. And they, and in a way, <laughs> that's them like showing their power over him. Like they fucked up his meeting tomorrow by and keeping him out. His excuse is always, I have to take out the trash, but he goes to this cabin that's always behind their house. <laughs> his his wife knows. Yeah. You know, she just doesn't want to she's like look if it doesn't interfere with our lives i'll let you do this but uh this next clip i just had to have it all because like pesto is so goddamn funny to me <laughs> in this year this is pastor the giant robot from my solo show that opens tomorrow what you remember you're the guest of honor yeah you can count on me pesto i'll be there i'm counting on you look and here's your ticket it's very big for a ticket Wow, I love these bubble letters. Yeah, Brescia did the bubble letters. <laughs> oh, well, they're really cool. I know, but honestly, I did have a little inspiration. Here, have some criddle glitter. <laughs> oh, uh, not tonight, because tomorrow morning I've got that big corporate project meeting. Oh, you're going through with that corporate project. Because <laughs> I thought you knew that if you did that, we'd never talk to you again. That corporate project sounds cool. Hey, stay here, have one cream soda, then we'll let you get to bed. (laughs) I knew you guys would understand. One cream soda, please. We're totally good. Oh my gosh, guys! You want to see my dance? (laughs) I love that. uh, Hadlon's delivery, like, you want to see my dance and then just like <laughs> act like that's very important that's so good and like a lot of these shows they have like the source of their power it's not gummy berry juice it's the criddle glitter yeah. i love the words criddle glitter. glitter yeah that's criddle glitter. you almost said clit henry yeah, and that's, that's a careful. this is explicit now this yeah. podcast <laughs> no i i also just love god the that ticket line really gets me now because <laughs> The ticket has to read as a ticket later, like when he sees it in his pants pocket, it needs to be big. But then when he's given it at first, he's like, very big for a ticket. It's like, yeah, it needs it, a realistic <laughs> ticket would be smaller. But and we see that uh, Pace does resentful of Brusho uh, uh, immediately, which is why Brusho doesn't get a seat at his at his one man show. I love, I love that like that feeling it's very recognizable the feeling of like oh you you did something yourself and then one person helped with a, a little thing and a person compliments that and you're like yeah that guy did that that's uh, that was that was me it shows pesto also drops his stupid voice for that he goes like yeah, yeah brush actually did that that's <laughs> like and brush was like oh you know like brush is the alpha of the group even if he's not as creatively good as pesto or makes as many things but yeah and then and also the bubble letters are part of the font so that the bumpy b is already like being set up there <laughs> i like that david stays out all night with the with the with the creative to criddles they're all doing uh crittle glitter not drugs and drinking cream sodas though this also is like uh similar to randy a destructive party like a party that uh, mm-hmm. a self-destructive party you shouldn't be doing we don't see the uh much of it though we just kind of smash cut to david at the meeting right yes. yeah I, oh, by the way that's paul rudd yes paul rudd movie star paul rudd i can't Man himself i didn't yeah. know that was him until you said oh we didn't mention paul rudd i'm like wait paul rudd is in this <laughs> right and it's like oh he plays david okay I like his delivery as David, but I like when I listen to it, I'm like, that doesn't sound like him, but yeah, it's him. Yeah, it's him. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. Yeah, again, we didn't ask any questions about a movie star. We're sorry. I, I bet Scott probably had funny stories about working with Paul Rudd. Who's it's always every story I hear about him is like, he's a funny guy. He's a cool dude. But uh, could you believe he's 50, Bob? Can listen, guys. It? I think he's starting to age in a, in a very handsome way, but let's not make the Dick Clark jokes about him because when he gets much older, it's not going to be as fun. Yeah, you know? hey, it'll happen to all of us. Yeah, man. like yeah, I but but yeah, I I also just love Brusho and all this. Like first he dogs on him for the corporate gig and then says, "I'm kidding." And then as they open, like that's so realistic. The way when they're opening the drinks together, it's like we're good, we're good, man. <laughs> and like that's what your friend says to you when he does not mean that. These guys are just trying to pull him down. I know they don't that, want him to succeed. They don't 
there, man. Like that. What a great, like, just like how realistic to bad toxic friendships. Randy is same here. These are all people who are creative together. And now they technically act like they're rooting for one another. But David keeps being pulled down by these creative critters who don't want him to succeed. Or they give him a guilt trip about like, oh, you're trying to cut us out of your life. Uh, <laughs> like, no, no, no. Uh, but yes, the, it was after a long night, David goes to the bumpy, the big bumpy subs meeting. David, David, David. We've invited you to this big corporate project meeting based on the strength of your portfolio. It's very creative. Yeah, creative. <laughs> you know what they say, you got to make a big mess to find the masterpiece. Make a big mess? <laughs> <laughs> this corporation has rules. Oh, no, no, no. It's, uh, it's just a, a metaphor. I'm not making a, a literal mess. No, no. <laughs> I'll be good. Very well, David. Very well. Now, we're going to take a chance on you and allow you to work on the crown jewel of our empire, the Bumpy Bee Subs logo. Oh, wow. I've always loved the Bumpy's logo. It's so <laughs> simple. <gasps> he thinks it looks simple. This logo took decades to perfect. We tried a version with Serif. Our stock dropped 700%. The last designer who worked on it killed himself. <laughs> so, David, are you willing to dedicate your life to the Bumpy Bee? Yes, sir. Well, then prove it by eating this bowl of barf. <laughs> uh, that's great. Uh, uh, I, I like how arbitrary because you just look like David is correct. It's just it's so simple. It's just the B. It's just yeah. like the most generic font. It's, but then it points out like how much it destroyed their business when they added serifs. Oh, man. I just love this feeling when you're in a meeting with like important people who you think that you're joking around with them. They go like, oh, David. And then you're like, yeah, I know. Pretty funny. I was like, what? How dare you? <laughs> like they, they instantly like David gets fucked around with by everybody in his life really like he's not even his wife is just like kind of, oh i'm just kidding David. he mistakenly assumed that they were on the same level yeah then you have to just like no no no. it's it's just a metaphor i don't need a little old mess i'll be good i'll be good like it's just like instantly cowering like <laughs> just, i'll be good uh brush is right he is being messed up by this corporate crap man and this uh this eat the bowl of barf thing is uh, uh yeah. i know you wouldn't like that Henry, yes, but yeah. it's like he's just like yeah, what and they're like yeah eat it he's just like uh okay and then they it was all a big bluff to see if he would like debase uh, himself i know they're like okay well you can work for us since we've uh, since we've shown that you will eat a bowl of bar but it is real buff uh yeah get rid of this now. yeah just like david nubbins like just there i lamarche really gets this character like so uh, he's like well okay if you don't want that like just the great uh ridiculous sitcom boss he who, killed himself he killed himself and like they, there's a slide of the suicide <laughs> right. that he shows him oh just a cover a covered body on the ground seemingly they jumped off a building <laughs> it's, oh man and so so yes by proving he will supplicate himself uh david does get the big job he's got the big uh, bumpy b assignment here to redesign the b bumpy subs is also a great name too just like <laughs> yeah subs are bumpy they've got stuff on it especially with uh, that uh, dutch crunch bread oh yeah with a little slice on that oh yeah Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yes, yeah, so David, he gets the job. He heads home to celebrate. And uh, you know what? Sometimes you just want to spend time with your spouse, not see your bad friends anymore, <laughs> as, as David learns. Do you have any paste? I'll paste it back on and give you a show. Paste. Show. <gasps> paste no show. Oh, no. Um, uh, you know what? I think I have to go outside and, and uh, uh, take out the trash. Now, David. Don't you think the trash can wait? Trust me, I can compete with a smelly bag of trash. <laughs> well, you know what? Actually, I think I'm gonna like not taking out the trash. Now, where's that paste? <laughs> well, I guess David hates me. David doesn't hate you. It was that evil corporate project meeting. It's turned him corporate. Hey, uh. I don't want to stand. Can I take David's seat? No, 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 no. He still <laughs> might come. You know the rules. No late entry. Now, Pesto, show us what you got. All right, Pesto and I welcome you to the greatest, funnest, coolest show ever. <laughs> the Pesto Show. 
So like another uh, abrupt uh, jump to credits. Sobbing jump during, to credits. During a disturbing yeah. scene or just like a morose scene. Uh, I just love, I love Pace's like, well, I guess David hates me. <laughs> but then still he's like, no, 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 he might still come. Like just, he's, he's, he's so, taking out his resentment on Brusho by not giving him a seat. Uh, Brusho man. has to stand. It's so great. Like Pasto and Pasto's, man, this pays off in such a great joke in the fourth episode where Pasto then does his full version of his one man show and his sobbing at the start is actually part of the act <laughs> like it's it he wasn't crying out of uh, out of losing the plot it's him staying on script is sobbing on stage that's such a great reveal I love that <laughs> the pesto show <laughs> because you're watching this first time you think pesto is putting on like a bad show like but actually turns out that it rules <laughs> it rules it's like you know it's like a blue man group show but even more artistically rewarding and and that again is like brusho i think is kind of jealous of him and is is kind of uh, holding him back i i also just love Cree summer's delivery of like trust me i can compete with a smelly bag of trash <laughs> like, what a great what a great sexy line to say and then he's like you know what i think i'm gonna like this also like, like she's wearing lingerie but her the strap broke she wants to paste it back together <laughs> yes. which doesn't make any sense yeah. well, she only says that so she can combine the words like paste and show yeah and so he can with paste show paste <laughs> show uh then the oversized ticket he can really notice it there god i just yeah just pasto's crying just so good man and and yeah the credits too you can see who produced what and how it's like uh, it's another junior like it's a lot of familial collect- connections in here and speaking of family somebody wants their mommy hey Trevor, i bet if i gave you a 10 second head start you couldn't beat me in a race yeah, right. I've always been the faster twin. You're wrong. Okay, on your mark. Get set. Go! Ah! Ah! I want my mommy! Ah! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ah! Hey, Trev, I'm actually kind of jealous. You never told me you were taking a trip. No, that wasn't cool, man. Wait, you know what is cool? This Super smash exclusive movie preview from your favorite star, Johnny Ryan! Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think Scott told us in the interview uh, that we did with him that uh, they had to keep this uh, rivalry within the reality of the show. So it's like we had to make sure they would film things that could like conceivably be put on TV. So it's like you could still see Trey Boy was not expecting to be injured this hard, but he's still playing along. Yeah, he's still acting it out. And obviously they're not going to do like a second take. So they're like, well, yeah, I'm just use this. And he's but just him holding his knee bleeding. And like and later you'll see his knee is messed up. Like he needs <laughs> uh, he needs at least a bandage over it and just that he's like trying to act cool about it but his character's gone like bleh, bleh. like he's not saying talking like that anymore he's like dude not cool come on man <laughs> I, he's just yeah. like check it out I think <laughs> it's pain uh, yeah I think too this is Skip like this is Skip's showmanship taking over that he's like you know what I already made fun of him in the last couple sketches this time I'm just gonna trip him and everybody laughs at him and everybody loves me Skip like that's so good and I feel like I'm diving to the reality behind this but i feel like trey Bohr, uh after being unexpectedly injured I, like was improving his way out of the scene like he oh i gotta scream out something funny so he does i want my mommy right yeah. but it comes out to haunt him later uh that's why yeah when he tries to pretend it was like he says i was just trying to make you laugh He's like no you weren't everybody laugh at him like yeah poor poor trey Bohr. but yes then comes really the funniest thing in the whole first yeah. episode no uh I, I i told this is the first thing so we recorded that talking simpsons or sorry we took recorded a podcast the ride with scott and uh you know mike carlson and jason sheridan and the first thing i told scott was this is my favorite thing but i had not seen all of smash yet but it, it's still my favorite thing upon watching it again the, i i appreciate this on so many levels i enjoy every single mislead like i wrote every one down there's like 10 different misleads and some of them i forgot Ugh, but I, it still made me laugh out loud and I, I just love apparently this was like kind of expensive to do because of yeah. all the places he had to be <laughs> yeah i loved hearing that uh uh, you know that Scott had mentioned to us you know they everything's the budget is tight you got especially in live action there's only so much you can film but this sketch if you don't have a bunch of new places to go and a ton of set changes and and a fancy car then the concept doesn't work you need ridiculous things stacked on top of each other and yeah I mean this sketch uh it's it's two minutes 34 seconds long <laughs> I I'm gonna just drop in the whole thing right here 
Tyler's new in town, and he's about to learn that high school isn't all it's cracked up to be. We have a new student, his name is Tyler. <laughs> but there's something a little different about Tyler. He's a rollerblader. My skate! And when you rollerblade at Hamilton High, you don't exactly fit in. Here, take this. A skateboard? But skateboarding isn't Tyler's only problem. Because he's got a royally big secret. Lauren, I have to be honest about something. Yeah, tell me anything. As you can see, I'm not a fan of pizza. But his luck is about to change when Tyler finds Whoa. one million dollars. Eat my dust, Jacob! But it's going to take a lot more than money. You used to be different. To win over the girl of Tyler's dreams. Now you're just like everyone else. Come on, Lauren. Clearly I'm different than everyone else. Look at me, I'm inside a sports car. And his world's about to turn upside down when he finds out I'm on the Skyhawks. Hey, Tyler, when the game's on the line, I'm passing you to rock. Mo Jones knows my name. But before he steps on the court, he's got to go back in time. Okay, now, you dudes look weird. And then go forward in time. Huh? Hey, Teach, my report's going to be a little different. That's why class is dismissed. Hey, Martinez, not bad. Here, you know what to do with this. He's amazing. Matt Hartwell, Lottie Wolf, the Spider Brothers, and Johnny Rash as the, the video, video Game, Game Master. Master. You forgot to mention one thing. I, a ninth grader. God damn it, that's so good. <laughs> yeah. And when I described the sketch to Scott, I brought it up it, by saying the sketch about the guy who's in a king costume because at no point did they say yes. he's a king. And you think that's going to be from the second you see this. I love that Simisley, like, he's got one big secret mm -hmm. and a royally big secret, oh, even. Royally big. Uh, God. But every mislead is amazing uh, that he goes back in time and then forward in time. <laughs> and uh, the final title reveal, I, I totally forgot that the movie. Movie is called the Video Game Master. Video Game Master. You forgot to mention one thing. I'm a ninth grader. Oh God, everything. Yeah, God. we're just yes. gonna be repeating our favorite lines from the sketch. But the the amount of different twists they make to avoid why he's dressed the way he is, I, I just I I want to applaud this sketch. It's so good. They never do it. They never tell. When he goes back in time and he's by the guards who are dressed like him, and he reacts like, "You guys look weird." Like. <laughs> So and his way of talking is insane. There's oh man, okay, there's so many little details in this. But first off, yes, I love that this is like every high concept Disney kids live action movie shoved into one. It's like, what if a kid gets rich? What if they go back to King Arthur's court? What if they are Bill and Ted style and come back in time? Then it's the wizard. Then it's also skateboarding. Then it's like then it's him being bullied. Like it's all of these things and in then one. It's the wizard, right? Yes, oh sorry, you mentioned yeah, the wizard. Yeah, I thought you were I thought I was thinking of an actual wizard because he's a king. Also, the, yes, yeah, but that—that that is the wizard at the end, like just that after his big song. I also love too that he says like, uh, "Now, teacher, this is gonna be a little different." <laughs> and, but when he sings his song, he drops the accent because Johnny Rash, the actor, can't sing in the accent. Right. He goes into his regular singing voice. And like, a lot of this is laid in like uh, the Mega Mitten commercial makes sense because it's all tied into this programming block where they're trying to sell things to kids. So in the movie, he's trying to 
sell the Mega Mitten as well. Yeah. And with the Johnny Rash stuff, uh, we see this interview with him being just like very, very pissy, very much a, like a diva. And he tells girls, shut up, that are yeah. saying, Johnny, he's like, oh, shut up. But uh, shut up is his thing. That gives him the inspiration for a song. Well, also like this film co-stars Lottie Wolf. Yeah. This is where he met Lottie Wolf to set up their doomed <laughs> future, man. And and, Lo- and uh, Lottie Wolf, she's played by uh, an actress in her mid-20s who plays young very well. It's uh, Geraldine Viswanathan, I believe is how it's pronounced. She's really great as Lottie Wolf playing the like Blossom style character. <laughs> yeah. who's, the arc of her character through the season is so interesting because she is like this good girl gone bad kind of thing, or at least that's how the media in the world is portraying it of like everybody wants her to date the character she's supposed to date in the TV show and instead she starts dating the bad boy and as I, like Heather Locklear style perhaps. That character's like the Zach Morris type or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and instead she's dating the, well, Johnny Depp style guy who's a Johnny Rash. Like, But yeah, you can now figure out she met him on the set of this. Also the Spider Twins, I, uh, the Spider <laughs> Brothers, the Spider Brothers. Spider Brothers. brothers. Yeah. I forgot to look, I don't know if you can see his feet on the screen, but if he was wearing two different kinds of shoes, Johnny oh, Rash. Oh, I didn't catch I bet, that. I bet yeah. he was. I bet uh, I bet Kyle Mooney was wearing two different pairs of shoes <laughs> for that scene, uh, even if we couldn't see them. He's v- method. God, I just love, like, eat my dust, Jacob. <laughs> like, God. And also, like, he's, like, what does he need a million dollars for? They do all these things for no reason. And, oh, yeah. And, they yeah, he joins the, the a, a basketball team. Like, Mo Jones knows my name. <laughs> like, and that is Mo Jones, one of the brothers from Pro Bros, mm. the, uh, the actual star oh. brother. It's his brother is the star pro. You know what? I wasn't even thinking that, but it does tie into pro bros. <laughs> There's so much of the of the things there. And also, this is when I caught the logo at the start. It's Herb Wimbley Pictures. Herb Wimbley, the creator of Puppy the Dog, the Mickey Mouse style character of the world. So this is a Disney movie. It even starts with the Herb Wimbley Productions thing kind of has like a an arc of a shooting star over it, just like the same mm. as the Disney shooting star yeah, logo I, too. I recall seeing Puppy the Dog in this first episode. That was it. Uh, and the next and the next Tronic logo is in the credits too, so you know Nintendo played for, paid for the, the Nintendo of this world, paid for it as well. God, they're just like, it's a great sketch on its own. Like just a fantastic sketch of just like endless misdirect of the one obvious twist you're waiting for in a film full of twists. But also all of the world building is in there for you to find if you look for it. And I just love that so much. And, and yeah, that it ends with, instead of it ending with the obvious thing of the music thing of like, sorry, teach my, my uh, report is going to be a little different. Instead is the bully comes up like, you know what to do with this. And then everybody <laughs> just watches him play a video game on a 14 inch television yeah. monitor. And God. it's the same game the kid was playing in the in the Mega Mint commercial, just like this crappy darts game. Yeah. Oh God, that's so good, man. And just and and also hearing Maurice LaMarche exactly knows what this is. It's an eighties trailer and just him saying like the video game master like, it, like all, for a film called the video game master if you see this in theaters you're like why is there all of this bullshit before he plays a video game That's and insane. i like that the video game thing is the last part of the trailer but it's like what oh. what about every other crazy thing that happens the, like the, the most important thing about this is that he plays video games oh and yeah the fantastic final misdirect that he comes out says wait you forgot one thing I'm in the ninth grade. <laughs> God, <laughs> everything's funny in this season, but I if if there's one best sketch of the season, it might be this one. It's so good. It's it's so so good. I and I I'm glad I'm glad Budget Crunch or other uh, realities were able to come together and they could still make this work mm-hmm. in, in film. And also, yeah, we Scott touched on it a little bit, but I have to think all, doing any of this in COVID times was probably not easy. <laughs> yeah, I think he went over the. T- timeline in our interview sorry it's been a few days since we had the interview yeah, it's been yeah. minutes since you've heard it but <laughs> no it was it was all during covid though and yeah in, in atlanta they did it yeah but but yeah so after all that skip and trey Bor say goodbye whoa that movie looks zuzzy zazz what what's wrong still want your mommy, I want my mommy. that was you <laughs> i was just trying to make you laugh no you weren't that was all right, we got some great cartoons next week, including a brand new Stronghold. Yeah, and I'm on it. You're what? Yep, the Skipster is doing a voice. I wonder what I look like all cartoonified. Wow, that sounds... 
good, good for you, Skip. It's great. Until next week, kids. Remember, you're never too old to yell. I want my mommy. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, only he says whoa. Yeah, it's that yeah. Traybor is too pissed off. <laughs> Knowing where this goes, it, uh, it escalates very well. Where uh, for about half of this episode, uh, Traybor's kind of in on it, just like yeah, I'm, I'm getting goofed on, but we're playing characters. But after a while, it gets kind of personal. Yes, yeah. And then it leaves off on this sour note. Hearing it in the in uh, audio here, it also when he goes like, "No, you weren't." There's a cut, like you can <laughs> tell. So implied in that cut is that they had a more intense fight. That they were like, "No, cut, cut." They're like, "No, you weren't." And then you can imagine Skip and Traybor had like a loud argument and they're like okay guys reset guys and next week a new brand new strong <laughs> this is when skip is inventing like catchphrases for himself like yeah. zuzzy's ass it's like <laughs> reminds me of like Polly shore like munching on grindage and the weasel exactly, and all that stuff yeah. just, like what does that, any of this shit mean uh Trebor is right to think that's dumb and he's just making stuff up garbage but i and that Trebor also like the hurt on his face is like obviously like you would think a producer would want them as a duo it's skip and Trebor on yeah. the show they're identical <laughs> but for some reason the makers of strong were like we just want skip we don't want you Traybor. no one wants you and just this is the first of many times Traybor is going to learn people just want skip and not <laughs> him and it, it really hurts you can see it just hurts his feelings more and more and more on it and that also just pays off in the end that once they see eye to eye at the very end of the series then they're both getting overshadowed by corby mm-hmm. the third <laughs> we told you there'd be spoilers yes yeah but it's a great first episode that really does say set the stage for it. you know sometimes on netflix shows i think some have complained that netflix shows get too into setting a breadcrumb trail or like oh you gotta watch the next episode let's get you to watch the next episode like it feels uh sometimes it feels unnatural in this show it feels very natural mm-hmm. it's a story told over eight episodes where things grow and change for characters and it builds really well and it all yeah. starts here like it's all clear right there I-, I would say the only unrealistic thing is that these uh cartoons with in the show are like uh serialized and well that was never the case when we were growing up but yeah for the yeah. sake of the netflix model they have to be and you know what i like following the stories i like following randy and the creative riddles and the pro bros <laughs> and the strong it's uh, all it's all very well done man yeah i i do god the the strong we said it scott but the strong slowly being shoved out of their own cartoon and just being like hey can we help you nah <laughs> okay and just uh, uh, from how minor uh, skips first appearances on the show yeah yeah, I you know another thing I I got a I should come on Scott on on is how they build into the Dahai Islands like mm. they say the Dahai Islands so much that implies that like the local government there is giving them a ton of money to film <laughs> things and how they constantly have to say like in the beautiful Dahai Islands and here we are I'm on the Dahai like even in the Skip and the Strongmore movies they're like and here I am in the Dahai Islands when I should be having fun <laughs> there's there's a ton of world building uh, that you would not expect from this show and like i said going back to it from episode one again I'm, i noticed like all of these things that they're being laid in, in preparation for the future it's yeah. like it's so rewarding to go back and go and check uh, everything out again man and then and last sketch i didn't compliment scott on that i'll say now it's like that slingers one that is a pokemon parody kind of thing of just like that it's just them learning to play the game and yes. like that when he's being told like if you only you can find them all like that he he asked the guy voice by by scott can i just find some of them no (laughs) you must find them all (laughs) that's about how marketing was uh, Uh, to us as little kids i guess that's technically that's the closest to a video game cartoon in the episode but it's it's great but yeah i guess my final thought yeah this show rules people if you haven't watched smash yet seriously watch smash it's great i would say underappreciated it came out at a at a weird time i think it came up uh around like i think it released december 10th is the date i found right which is like i think we were all just very busy then (laughs) yes yeah for the holidays and it's not like a holiday theme thing so you might have missed it and mm-hmm. netflix is really bad at promoting things quite bad and uh often you have to search for the name exactly and uh this was uh shoved in my face because they know i was a uh, total like <laughs> i was totally the audience for this show but the maybe maybe knows yeah. us pretty well but yeah maybe, maybe not for you but just search uh, search in the search bar use that rare uh, netflix search bar there and give it a, give it a while and, and you know what too if you still haven't watched it watch moonbeam city mm-hmm. you know it's on paramount plus now check check that out as well and I guess, uh, and thanks again, Scott, very much. You were the zuzziest and the zazziest. <laughs> 
Thanks again for listening to What a Cartoon. If you want to support us and get all these episodes one week ahead of time and ad free, please go to patreon.com slash talking Simpson. Sign up there for five bucks a month. You'll get just that, but also access to everything behind the five dollar paywall. That includes access to over 100 full length bonus episodes that you haven't heard if you're not a patron. And that also includes access to our monthly Patreon exclusive mini series, Talking Futurama and Talking of the Hill. You can only get those if you're behind the five dollar paywall at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. And there is a ten dollar level as well. If you sign up for that, you get all the five dollar stuff of course but also access to one mega long extremely long podcast once a month only for patrons of that level or higher and what is that henry bob is talking about the what a cartoon movie podcast once a month you get to hear us talk about an animated series on the regular episodes but we also at the end of each month do an animated feature film super duper in depth often over four hours sometimes even five hours long we haven't recorded it yet but i bet this one in april will be over five hours because we'll be talking about 1988's roger rabbit if you have more memories of the of cartoons like that were on smash i bet you loved roger rabbit too because we did and we we talk all about that film in the months before. Last month, we covered the Disney Golden Age classic Pinocchio. The month before that, South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut. And a huge, over three years back catalog, films as diverse as Akira to a Goofy movie, as I like to say. Over 220 hours of podcasts there. In addition, all the $5 things Bob mentioned. Please check it all out at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. So I've been one of your hosts, Bob Mackey. You can find me on Twitter as Bob Servo. I have another podcast, by the way. It's called Retronauts. It's a classic gaming podcast all about old video games. You can find that wherever you find podcasts or go to patreon.com slash retronauts. Sign up there for two full-length bonus episodes every month. And Henry, what about you? Follow me on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. That's when you'll stay up to date with all the stuff going on in Henry Gilbert's cartoonified life. Also, follow on Twitter at Talk Simpsons Pod to stay up to date on all the stuff that goes on whenever new podcasts podcast go live on the patreon on the free feed when there's polls when there's news stay in the loop if you follow at talk simpsons pod on twitter and of course if you want an easy to search back catalog of all of our free episodes go to talking simpsons podcast.com for that and tons of other neat info about us thank you so much for joining us folks we'll see you again next time for our extended free preview of our what a cartoon movie all about who framed roger rabbit and we'll see you then Turn after these messages. messages.